Today's episode is being broadcast in 320 megabits per second to preserve How Did This Get Made's creative vision. We saw Zack Snyder's Justice League, so you know what that means. Now it's time for How Did This Get Made? We're gonna have a good time, celebrate some failure, not just be a hater. Did you know you wonder how did this get made? Let's wallow in the mediocrity of subpar art. Perhaps we'll find the answer to the question, how did this get made? Hello, people of Earth. I have gone by many names. Some have called me Martian Manhunter. Others call me Tall John Shear. Welcome to How Did This Get Made? And hold on to your mother boxes. Today we are talking about Zack Snyder's The Justice League. It's an epic. Consider it Bat Her, Return of the Superman. Here's the premise. Batman and Wonder Woman team up with The Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg to protect the Earth from an evil that threatens to eradicate life on the planet. Uh, In doing so, they must uh, revive Superman, and it all ends in Russia. Now that's the plot. Now, If you're wondering what is Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League, let me explain it as quickly as I can possibly do it. Uh, Zack Snyder, he had planned on a five-film series in the DC universe. That's Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman, a Justice League trilogy. Uh, But because of Batman vs. Superman and Suicide Squad not really working, people being upset with it, uh, they decided they would... uh, bring in somebody to make it a little bit lighter, a little bit more fun. So uh, they brought in Chris Terrio, who is responsible for uh, Rise of Skywalker, as well as Argo. Uh, They shoot the movie. They finish it. They're like, okay, this is pretty good. Uh, 90% complete. Uh, Warner Brothers watches it. They say, this is unwatchable. They hire Joss Whedon to come in and rewrite the script and help with the reshoots. Uh, During uh, this time, uh, Zack Snyder suffers a terrible family tragedy. He leaves the project. Joss Whedon then gets full control of the production. Uh, He adds 80 pages to the script, uh, only uses 10% of Snyder's original footage, uh, changes the score, and the movie comes out. And uh, basically, people are like, at best, it's a Frankenstein movie. It's just it incongruous tones. People don't really love it uh, at all. Uh, the movie kind of tanks. They go away from the franchises. They go into these individual films. And then online, this growing movement of release the Snyder Cut comes out. It seems like a joke. It seems like this is never going to happen. They get 180,000 signatures on some virtual petition. And all of a sudden... In 2019, we hear that it's it's happening. The Snyder Cut is happening. Um, it initially is going to involve some reshoots. Uh, it's going to cost about $30 million to finish. Zack Snyder comes in. He adds five minutes or less of new footage. Um, and the budget is now at $70 million to complete the film. That is what we watched. Four hours and two minutes of a film that was 90% complete via, you know, uh, re- you know, not including VFX shots. So this is the version, and this is what we're going to get into today. And, and there's no better person, and there's no better people to talk about uh, this with uh, today than our guests, but also my co-host. Please welcome Jason Manzoukas. Paul, wow. Um, uh, this is, this was wild. This was yeah. a wild, this has been a wild journey to watch, um, the, as you said, like the progression of Zack Snyder's D, like larger DCEU, uh, the creation of it as it's been going. I have not enjoyed it no. uh, as it's been going along. I am, uh, I, I am a, a, I was a Marvel kid, not a DC kid, Same. but I'm fully open to DC movies. I liked the Richard Donner Batman, I mean, Superman rather. I enjoyed Nolan's Batman. Um, Same. But these movies, Man of Steel, and then just in preparation for this, this is this is the nightmare that I've decided to live in. In preparation for this conversation, I have watched the Batman v Superman extended cut that is Ooh, three hours mistake. long. A mistake. And is like, it might as well be a, a, a concrete, brutalist piece of architecture. It is <laughs> so insane. Um, and then I've watched Whedon's cut and I, I watched the Snyder cut. I did that. So, so, so we are, we for are those in. of you complaining, that you just watched the Snyder Cut? Fuck you. 
I, I watched all of it. <laughs> I did too, and I'm excited to talk to you. And and I've got we, takes. I've got takes for days. Bring these guests. Let's do I, this. I cannot wait. Uh, this is going to probably be a different episode. I, I have a feeling it's going to be I a different episode. I suspect it is. Um, and never have I been so thankful that uh, June Diane Rayfield is out of town and unable to record <laughs> because we would never wow. have a chance to do this episode. Uh, <laughs> she would not stand for it, and rightly so. Rightly so. Uh, I don't think she would even <laughs> let you watch this movie at home. I don't believe so. Yes. So don't uh, you have? Doesn't she have parental <laughs> blocks on certain channels for you? I. <laughs> she does it on my computer and on my phone. Uh, <laughs> I can only watch YouTube Kids. Um, look, I will say that my history with June and superhero uh, movies is I've very... I've been banned from YouTube Kids. <laughs> the only... <laughs> well, that's because you make those weird, like, uh, <laughs> those Don't, weird Mario walkthrough videos. Uh, all right, so, uh, yes, June's only... The only two superhero movies I think June has seen, well, definitely Wonder Woman, definitely Ant-Man, and she fell asleep during Guardians of the Galaxy 1. That's that's where I know where she's at. So this would really be a, a tricky one for her to get into. Um, but we have decided to cross over, uh, share the space with one of our, our favorite podcasts. Uh, I'm going to introduce them both individually. But talk about their podcast, first of all. You know them as uh, Together as the host of Blank Check, which reviews directors' complete filmographies, episode to episode, specifically auteurs whose early successes afforded them a rare blank check from Hollywood to produce passion projects. Each new miniseries uh, kind of breaks them down, uh, gets into great detail. Right now they're doing this amazing um, bracket, uh, directors against directors going uh, up against each other, which is just fantastic, but individually. Um Individually, Listen, they are also hashtag the two friends. Yeah, yeah, yes, they are. You know, you, don't worry. They are also hashtag the two friends. And let's not forget that sometimes, you know, those checks, they, they, they cash and sometimes they bounce, baby. <laughs> uh, please look up our first guest, Griffin Newman. You know him as Arthur on The Tick or Watto on the George Lucas talk show. <laughs> he also lends his voice to the upcoming Masters of the Universe revelation on Netflix. Griffin, how are you? I'm I'm doing all right. Uh, you know, uh, Jason was uh, throwing down his his bona fides for how deep he had gone into Snyder in the last week. I did all of that plus Man of Steel and Dawn of the Dead. So I oh, I wow. feel like Dawn of I the spent. Dead? Yeah, I Dawn want to go back to the good. beginning. I want to go back to the beginning. Yeah, you yeah. got to see the whole thing. Uh, all right, and uh, and our next uh, co-host for today's show, uh, also a host of Blank Check. Please welcome David Sims. He's a film critic at The Atlantic. And his interview with uh, Chloe Zhao is excellent. If you have not read that, she directed oh. No Man Land. So please welcome David Sims. How are you, David? Uh, thank you. I'm doing well. It was fun. I feel like Chloe and I mostly talked about her dogs. We kept swinging back around to her dogs in that interview. <laughs> That's what I remember most. Uh, I would like to say that I watched the Snyder Cut, and then I said to my wife, "Like, you know, should you know, maybe I throw on the 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 Joss Whedon version, like, because I only saw it once." And she was like, nah, "I don't, I don't want you to do that." And so <laughs> all I did was I watched the Snyder Cut. But wow. I, look, I, I saw it all before. I've seen yeah. all this stuff. We should say that David has a one month old, so the fact that you were that able to even steal four hours to watch this is impressive. We we pulled you out of paternity leave, and we appreciate yeah. you doing this and. It's something that we are excited to have here. I want to, before we even get into this film, is there yes. any hot takes on where you rank like the DC universe? I'm opening up to everybody. Jason, I know we talked about you already, like, more of a, you know, more of a Marvel guy as I I'm as more, am I. You know, yeah. I have not enjoyed the Marvel. I've not rather enjoyed the DC movies almost at all. You know, okay. like they wow. have been... Um, I would say largely for me, with the single uh, exception of Wonder Woman 1, they have been um, unexceptional, uninteresting, and kind of overwhelmed by this Zack Snyder gloom. Um, uh, I'm going to disagree uh, with oh, you, you know right what, off though? the bat and say Aquaman. Shazam and is fun. Shazam Aquaman, is fun. Aquaman, yeah. actually, let uh, me Birds of that. Prey, and Shazam are all. I really. I. I I, Those are movies to me that are they are good in comparison to these other terrible movies. Mm -hmm. But if but none of them, I think, would I put up against Thor Ragnarok? Well, mm -hmm. that's a hard. That's a that's a that's why a, why well, why can't they do a Thor? Like the, why can't they do? Why can't they get there? That because that's like 
we're still in the beginning. We're not in the 10 year anniversary yet. I mean, Thor Ragnarok came right, out but, after but the 10 DC's years. But DC's acting like they're not at the beginning. That's well, my that's, problem. That, DC that is, is like drowning the marketplace with stuff. Like, and, and we can get into it, but I mean, my <laughs> hottest of hot takes is, and I hate to say this because I believe that the only reason we have the Snyder Cut is because of toxic fandom and because right. toxic fandom was rewarded, which is now only going to embolden toxic fans. Because toxic fandom was rewarded, we got I the know. Snyder Cut. And I'm, I'm here to say the Snyder Cut is a better version of the movie Justice League. Full stop. Uh, yes. Yeah. Far, uh, far better. Yes. Yeah. Far better. Well, yeah, far. Better. Yeah. Far better. I mean, it's also four hours long and has like multiple moments of like minutes long exposition dumps but nonetheless yeah, I'm, I'm in it I want I want I want to I want to at least I want to break it down but I want to hear where you guys stand uh David Griffin about uh on just the DCU where you're at mm-hmm. what do you feel what do you like what don't you like I I just let me before we get into this I just want to state that we had sort of fallen in backwards into sort of doing an ersatz uh, DC Universe miniseries right. on our podcast, even though we don't really like do franchises like that. And it was because th- of the weirdness of the fact that Warner Brothers seemed to be handing the whole thing over to Snyder, you right. know? Like, we, we're very much about, like, director visions and the weirdness of, oh, Marvel is so managed. It's Feige. He has control. He hands it to different people. Everything has to fit in together. And DC went, like, everyone reverse engineer your movies from the template that Snyder has set out was yeah. fascinating to us. So we did BVS. We thought that was going to be a one-off. Then when Suicide right. Squad came out so weird, we were like, I guess we have to do this. And that set us on the track. <laughs> and we've been mm-hmm. trying to move away from doing it because it does feel like – DC has diversified more. The films are becoming more individual, more separate from each other. You know, it's like we don't need to cover them all as if they're one thing. And I had been pushing, knowing that David was going to go on to a months long paternity break. <laughs> we have to do Snyder Cut in some way. And David would just go, no, 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 no. I mean, I get five words into, but what if we, no, absolutely not. I'm not taking time. I'm Look. not, I'm not. They announced, I figured this was coming in like May. Remember, this This thing kind of just came out. I mean, obviously yes. we knew it was coming, but then they suddenly were just like, yeah, it's coming out mid-March. Like, it's it's just going to drop. Like, I thought it was coming in the summer. They announced it's coming like three weeks after my daughter's birth. I'm like, I absolutely will not <laughs> watch a four-hour movie. I for, What I think I didn't realize was newborn babies are very demanding, but they are very immobile. So you are yes. actually kind of watching a lot of TV. As, it's as a, Paul, it's the best know. time right. because they don't yeah. requ- they require a lot, but also not so much. It's like you yeah. are you it's are grounded. Yeah, you right. are grounded. <laughs> you are grounded, and you are working. But it, there is a there's a simplicity to it. Once they start moving, it's a whole it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. You're Wait, so are you saying you your baby's first movie experience was the Snyder Cut? <laughs> No, because I mean, my baby's had. I mean, I'm watching a lot of movies right now, but okay. my, one one of my baby's first mo- movie experiences was the Snyder Cut. Certainly, <laughs> that's like my that's two chilling. week old baby. She started hiccuping about two hours into it. And there was like an hour of. What hiccuping, if your baby's so. first world is Mama Box? <laughs> Mama Box. Yeah, she calls my wife Martha for some reason. I look. <laughs> I, I should the Martha dig is so easy. I shouldn't do it. It's, um, good, it's good. Yeah, it's good. I know. I know. Look, I I remember seeing Batman versus Superman: colon, Dawn of Justice at the press screening. I was sitting with a bunch of critics. If you guys remember, there's a scene in that movie where the Flash emerges into a dream that Bruce Wayne is having and yells stuff at him. Uh, do you guys remember what I'm talking about? Oh, no, yes, I I'm yeah, early. Yeah. I'm too early. Right, right. <laughs> and it's a scene that is dropped in without explanation. And yes, we're all smart enough to know, like, he, uh, this is probably some you know larger universe play, th- that scene. But it is unexplained. And we all burst out laughing. Like, that's how we felt in 2016. Just all these critics, I remember just sitting in a row, just we watched this, we're like, what, what does this thing think it is? Like, what is it doing? And I'm thinking five years from now, the, I'm not going to call it turnaround, but the sort of evolution I have made on Zack Snyder's whole sincere deal yeah. with this DC universe 
is surprising to me. It, yeah, that's agree. all. That's how I'll put it. A good friend of mine last night, who is a very big comic book fan, uh, mm-hmm. reached out to me and he's like, "What did you think of the Snyder Cut?" And I said, "I think he only should make four-hour-long movies because there was <sighs> right. something yes. about this movie that felt." Like, oh, this is the most complete version of this director that I've ever seen. And I was there for it. I feel like the way he cut it up was like it recognized that, okay, you could watch it in parts. It was it. I don't know. There was something about the way that this movie gelled that worked for me, like on on a sure there's things to make fun of or whatever. But yes, there is something that really works here. And it I was is impressed. just it is just especially if you watch it in juxtaposition with the Joss Whedon cut or actually with Batman v Superman, it is simply more cohesive, more interesting, more successful, more successfully plotted. You know, like this the 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 Justice League movie is it, 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 confoundingly plotted. Right in, yeah. in, the, the, in the, the in the release the cut in the theatrical right. cut, yeah. right? The theatrical cut was like truly two hours of nonsense. Like yeah. it really was the Russian family, like even like <laughs> the like populated you're... Russian town that Steppenwolf is the single bad guy. The both you know in two hours they're trying to build a team, fight a world building evil, right. resurrect Introduce Superman three heroes. Right, three them have essentially right, right, yeah. not been in movies before. Yes, origin right, right. story characters who they just simply don't. They just show instead. They just show up and are now there. Cyborg. Um, might be one of my favorite characters now. Like, here's, literally. Here's how much I enjoyed the Snyder Cut. To a degree, I was like, the minute it started, my first note is, fuck you, it's in 4 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was it's like, fuck ratio. you. Yeah. How dare you make me watch a different aspect ratio? 20 minutes later, I'm like, I don't care. I don't care that it's in 4 3. This is infinitely better at explaining what's happening to me and tonally uh, consistently tonally consistent throughout which was which which the, the score helped which his uh editing helped i don't know like it just i stopped taking better. notes i stopped taking notes because like i'm here i'm in like every now and mm-hmm. then i might jot down one thing but i was like you have pulled me into a world and now i also get like people like oh it's cgi and slow-mo but it felt like I was going over to somebody's house to have a meal that I'd never had before, right? Like, mm. yes, there are a lot of things that I may not have picked myself. There are a lot of things that may not even be my favorite thing. But in presenting, being presented in a loving way, I was mm-hmm. open to trying everything there. And I found myself liking it more than I ever thought I would have. Like, Okay, I, I need to share my hottest take okay. that oh I've God. been sitting on. And and uh, I the feel kid, like, The kid Griffin Newman coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm overflowing with hot takes. Already we're, we're touched on so many things that I'm just like uh, champing at the bit to... Please, to, just interrupt to champ, champ, yeah. champ but, away, but my But I friend. will say right off the bat, because uh, you were asking for a previous history, Dave and I are much like you guys. We're, we're more Marvel... Uh, zombies than than DC fans. I think I like DC a little more than David does. Like I I actually read more DC comics. I think at our comic reading peak than you because you never really read DC titles at all, right? Only stuff like when Grant Morrison did All Star Superman. You know when people would come right. in and have like right. some sort of like uh, contained take. But anytime yeah. I tried to swoop in and be like, you know what? I'm going to read all the Batman titles. I would tap out really fast. Cause I was just yeah. like, I can't, you know, like I reading comic books. If you really want to do it, it's this, it's very time consuming. You got a lot, a lot of shit to keep up with. <laughs> yeah. And oh so God. like Marvel was always as David, much as are you I okay? could handle. You seem overwhelmed <laughs> by the concept of reading comic books. As a child. As it's a too child. Much. Where as a without a, without a cell much. phone, I it's imagine, or internet. I like mean, a real... like you're, I'm just imagining you as a young boy <laughs> on the streets of New York City going into the comic shop. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To buy mm-hmm. your comics, I have no waving reason to his believe. arms around. There are too many titles. <laughs> There's too many to keep titles. Up with this. I'm just a young boy living in New York City. 
you know, I know where you're going, Jason, but I was a young boy in New York City. I did go to the comic shop until nine <laughs> years of age. And then I went to the comic shop in London. Where what? I and then you were like, then you were like, whoa, give me that Judge Dread. You were like, give me these. Give me those Captain English. Britain. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't oh. wait to read Dennis the Menace, but the different one. I did read the Beano. I forget if we've talked about Beano. this on my podcast, Griffin. Anyway, Griffin, can you wait? What you was, have. Can you have a take? Griffin, yes, what's your so take? so I I was just gonna say I was less of a DC guy, but the three character the the three tales I read semi regularly and kept up with the universes of were Flash, Batman, and Teen Titans. So okay. like three members of this team essentially comprise the only things I ever seriously followed in the DC universe, right? I'm ostensibly in the tank for. In terms of my rankings, it was always like Wonder Woman's probably my favorite modern superhero movie point blank like i prefer wonder woman to all the mcu movies i think but then i put pretty much every other mcu movie in between there i'd say like shazam is close to wonder woman for me on that tier and then i like birds of prey and aquaman with some reservations and then everything else i could pretty much leave behind right i love yeah. aquaman i'm a huge yes. Aquaman uh, you know thank you true. david like to me like i i i'm i'm as excited to have you on because i also there's something about aquaman that i will say right. and I, i've talked about this where it's it is in many respects, like what a child would want a superhero movie to be. And I love it. Like, I just love it yes. because it's like, let's do that. And let's do, and there's something so pure. And again, like this movie, it's a pure vision. And I think you can like for what Joker's a whole other story, but I don't mind that when people with pure visions get involved in this, they make their version. And sometimes it really works. And Aquaman for me Look, really worked in that way. I have to I have to say something before Griffin says his take just before I lose the thread. I do think with DC, sincerity is crucial. Those heroes are much more sincere. They are these very simple heroes, not in terms of characterization, but just like in terms of what they stand for. Marvel was the second tier. The second guys coming in and, you know, offering more commentary and more grip. But DC, there's purity, like you say. So Wonder Woman, Aquaman, these successful movies, usually they were they were approaching their material very sincerely. And that's yeah. why they succeeded, I would say. Yes. And and I think the difference for me, and I, I want to make it clear, I like Aquaman just less than David. Sure. It's so good. But, I watched but, it. I watched it again recently. It's so good. I, I think the thing those two movies do really well is embrace all the silliest aspects of the characters that made them yeah. feel unadaptable for so long and put a lot of very earnest appreciation into the so, sort of pure totemic quality of what they represent, right? Yeah. Um, and I always just was kind of bummed out by the Snyder, like, oh, they hate being heroes. Mm -hmm. This world is so bleak. It's so dark. I mean, it always just kind of felt like Zack Snyder hates superheroes as a concept to me, you know? And, like, even when he was doing Watchmen and doing press for Watchmen, yeah. he kept on saying, like, I would never make a Superman movie. I don't get that guy. These are the kinds of heroes I understand. They're, like, drunk and they're angry and they're bitter and they're washed <laughs> up, you know? Like, he kind of framed it that way. And then the fact that he became the architect of this whole universe kind of bummed me out because it is a depressively dark uh, view of this thing. And BVS was kind of like for me, a real breaking point where I was just like, this is like incoherent to me. You know, beyond it feeling oppressive, this thing just like makes no sense. It is just confounding on a scene to scene basis. And my hottest take is that in my prep week, I watched the ultimate cut and I was like, oh, I get it. Wow. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I don't even know if I like it. I don't know if it's a bridge too far to say that, but like talking about what you said, Paul, of like you watch the four hours of this and go, maybe he should only make four hour movies. Yeah. BVS is like incoherent, perplexing two and a half hours. And you watch the ultimate cut and you're like, this makes sense on its own terms. I understand it. And perhaps you can only let Snyder go full Snyder and trying to rein him in at all is a recipe for disaster. Well, that's the mistake that is born out of both of of these extended cuts is they it illustrates to you that he did he was the messes that came out the messes that came out were met partially messes because so much had to be extracted to make the you know basically 
Marvel Marvel Phase One is ten movies long to set right. the stage for you know um, all of these individuals, then bringing them together into teams, then building out. They pop up in each other's movies, little bits here and there. You know, they do a good job of walking you into a constructed world of all of these people and how they're now all going to gel or not gel together. In this sense. They did, tried to do something similar, but I think Snyder's version of it was, let me just make the movies three plus hours long and we'll get all of those character introductions. We'll get all, we just won't do it in individual movies. And Warner Brothers was like, no, nope, we get, we need two minute, two hour movies, man. We need yeah. two hour movies. Yeah. And that's too much. Like well, to me, the they fact just that become, 90% of yeah. this movie was shot, like, I mean, really it was, I mean, 90% of this movie was done or whatever it was. Yeah, 100% was bunk. shot. It was 90% locked, essentially. Okay, right. It was so just minus VFX. final right. effects. Yeah. yeah. So right. that, to me, it speaks volumes. Like, oh, he shot a four-hour movie. Like, there's no version. I mean, the only, I guess, we're, we're all talking about the same thing. It was like, he made a four-hour, like, how do you make this smaller? Like, Oh, it's, we it's saw impossible. what it is. You you can't right. like he he right. he's not writing within and, the confines of movie making. No, and this is the most bananas thing to me, which I feel like we need to sort of acknowledge as we get deeper into everything. Obviously, the term everyone used for the Joss Whedon cut was Frankenstein, right? right. It, it's right. if I dare say it, a cyborged version of a movie, <laughs> right? Where they like took this yeah. much human and they built all these weird robotics around, it, and they're like, "This will be normal, right? This thing will not be cursed." Um, but I do think it is important because the framing of this now is like he finally got to make his absolute pure vision of the movie, which I don't think is totally accurate because there are two things. One of which you already said, Paul which is after the response to BVS, which was largely negative, they were at that point, I think, six weeks away from starting filming on Justice League. They were so bullish on it that they were like, right. we're going right in. And then the response to BVS was bad, even though it made money. But I think they felt like, oh, we can't double down on this. So then they like go red alert, Terrio and Snyder rewrite this, make it brighter, change the look of the movie. Like you have to make this lighter. So there was already an adjustment before Snyder started filming all of the footage that finally yes. made it into this I mean, film. Friends of mine in the press were brought on set for Justice yeah. League. They were shown, they were filming the scene where Batman and the Flash meet, you know, and it's That's sort of a That's the one that they scene. push so hard. Yes. And they were really pushing to the press and Snyder included. We're like, look, look, okay, well, you know, this one's going to be a little lighter. Don't worry. Like, you know, yeah. I know Batman versus Superman was a lot. Like they were trying <laughs> to Batman sell versus, like. Batman versus Superman was so, I mean, and this is what I, this is what it is for, to be considering when we're, if you were to look at these two um, comics universes, mm -hmm. DC and Marvel, unquestionably, DC is bright, poppy, like Boy Scout ethic gods. It's it's gods on earth. It's very yeah. it's morality tales. It is it is a blue sky with the exception of Batman. Um, and then Marvel exists in the real world. It is mm -hmm. real people who have real problems on top of the fact that they are superheroes. Spider-Man is a kid who can't figure it out. He's really struggling. And then he gets superpowers and has to, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now. I, I think also for so long, DC had the upper the upper leg on um, the, the sort of bug nuts cosmic shit. I feel like yes. Marvel had less success with that, and a lot of the stuff's been reclaimed now, but, like, the fourth world stuff, but even just Green Lantern, all these things from early mm -hmm. on, it was, like, the Marvel heroes were grounded, and DC was able to deal with, like, it's gods, it's yes. aliens, it's interdimensional, yes. it's alternate realities, things that Marvel has now caught up to that DC really nailed first. I, when, when I watch these movies... um. It's as if the lesson learned was, okay, Bat uh, Nolan's Batman is all of DC. Like right. in these movies, there is no real discernible difference between Gotham, Metropolis, and Central City. Genuinely, like, yeah. no. uh, like, like Central City is in the Snyder cut when you get the when you get to have that scene with Iris which is an incredible introduction oh. for, for Flash what? and the fact the that way, they cut that out is absurd every but introduction in this movie is, is great. 
Oh, phenomenal. Like, he's phenomenal. Both, he, he's great and 15 minutes long. Yes. We, yeah. Both of those things. It's both <laughs> of those things. But it's so helpful in yes. understanding the, yes. in, and putting this character in context yes. in the team. Right. It's Especially so helpful. if you're not going to take the time to do a Flash movie first, yes. a Cyborg movie first, an Aquaman movie first. Like, let's admit, another advantage that Snyder Cut has watching it in 2021 is we've seen an Aquaman movie already, right? There's right. like retroactively heavy lifting done there. Yeah, and well, then it does right, yeah. help that this movie, in the in the restored version, Flash and Cyborg are the two characters who get the most development and the best introductions and the clearest emotional arcs within the film itself. And they benefit for the movie. The they, they the movie it benefits, benefits. for uh, for yeah. having a, a better understanding. I mean. I mean, without a doubt, way for for Cyborg, it's night and day in terms yeah. of like how much more you understand about this character's journey and arc uh, com- comparatively. You know I what mean, I mean? Cyborg um, is literally the the heart of the movie uh, in a way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, yeah. but it's like, but it like. It's the reason why Superman comes back. It's it's it is the all the emotional, all the true like big hearted moments. It's not between the characters saving the day. It really is about like the sacrifice of uh, of of Joe Morton. Who look, this guy we know if he's working in a lab, shit is going to go wrong. I mean, we know this now from Keep Terminator Two. And this. <laughs> no, don't have Get him near him any metal lab. men. It's not good. <laughs> But on the other hand, how are you Warner Brothers and you look at this cut and you go, first thing that has to go, all the Joe Morton scenes. Like, Joe Morton's in, like, two minutes of Joss Whedon. That guy's fucking money in the bank. Yeah. So good. Here's the thing. Look, hiring Joss Whedon to make a sequel to Batman vs. Superman. Let's say, forget the Justice League. They literally, they make Batman vs. Superman and they're like, Joss Whedon, soup to nuts, make Justice League. That would be a bad decision. That would be a tough thing to pivot. Having him make a movie inside of a movie that was already made is a worse decision. The most insane decision is telling him also... It's got to be two hours long, 120 yeah. minutes, no more, yeah. no less, which has been widely reported. They insisted on for whatever reason. I, I mean, I, 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 I will also on. say, like, I will say this, like there's something I'm a, let's just take away the allegations right now and just talk about, like, I'm not trying to separate the artist from the thing. I just want to just talk about it in a, in a pure way and go, I love Joss Whedon and what he did sure. on Buffy. I was a big fan. When I first saw the Avengers, I was like, this is good. It was not my favorite, but it was good. Like, I was like, I like it. I really didn't like Age of Ultron. And when I saw what the Russo brothers did to Civil War, I was like, oh, that's that's my Avengers movie. Like, that's like that's how you do a team movie in the Marvel Universe that feels like it's got the right tone. My thought was, why do you take the guy who essentially fucks up the team movie in the Marvel Universe and then bring him over to fix up your problem in the DC, you know, it's like, oh, he he's already proven that that's not his strong suit. Like he well, messed it up, right? Like, I'll say this: fumbled like the ball. David yeah. and I, David and I are definitely Whedon Avengers fans over Russo Avengers fans. But mm. even still, it is very bizarre to hand that to him after Age of Ultron, which had a yes, similarly right. complicated reaction. And to the degree that also Whedon like kind of like steps away from Marvel and there's this like rejiggering. Yeah, he, I mean, he fought yeah. with the studio on that one. I, whatever. I right. mean, yeah. hiring Whedon was yeah. bizarre is all I'm saying under any yes. circumstances. Well, it's it's, yes. it's, it's, it's multi- on multiple levels. It makes like just the idea of bringing anyone in to do it is already going to be yes. tri- problematic. But somebody who's so totally different right. Right. is like... Well, it just I, yeah. speaks to the fact that they were... I think it sounds like Warner's was so panicked right. at how hopeless and dour and dark uh, Snyder's uh, worldview was that they were like, let's bring in... You know, like you watch these two... If you watch... And I don't recommend anybody do this ever. If you watch both the Snyder cut and the Whedon cut, like back to back, you see how there are reshoots that are like keeping a Snyder um, Aquaman line and then just change reshooting Batman's response line just to be a quip. 
All I, Joss yes. does is introduce like Buffy style, Joss Whedon style jokes, quips, Which uh, you know, ironic eye rolls. To the characters You're that watching are a script polish, but it's right. in a movie, like That's rather than just on thing. a page. Right. right. He's like, you know, an infamous script doctor, you know, and punch up guy who did that for so long before he had his own success doing his own stuff. And you're like, yes, it feels like you're watching him going through the script page by page and going, what if you added this? What if you added this? But right. it's something like something that like Shane Black can do effortlessly for yeah. Iron Man one. And it actually probably it probably cements why Iron Man one works. And thus we have the MCU. Right. But I I in this instance, it doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. Proof is in the pudding as far as like Ben Affleck in this movie. Like that, this Batman in the Snyder Cut is, I'm like, oh, I like this Batman. Like that other Batman is bizarre. Like it's, I don't know. I just feel like this, it's more consistent. There's, I mean, it's yeah. hard to, to have an actor do one version of the character and yeah. then the rewrite is, they're not even quips. They're out of. They're out of the voice. Like, I remember one of my friends told me that they did a, a punch-up one time. It was uh, a movie where, where aliens were in the house of this, like, young teen star. I forget the name of the movie. I would say it if I remembered it. But, aliens uh, in the Attic? It might have been Aliens. Yeah. I mean, yes. All right. So, and yes, I think it was. And the idea was <laughs> that when they shot the movie, the aliens didn't speak any discernible language. And then the studio was like, ooh, we need to now add language like as if they were speaking the entire time. <laughs> so everyone had to come in and like generate language around a movie that they were shot to not have them responding to language, which is, you know, an insurmountable feat. But that's kind of what it feels like here. Where it's yes. like, like, well, how can he in one scene be like the Zack Snyder Batman and then another scene be like the Joss Whedon? They're they're very different characters. Well, it also it feels like, you know, with most of like punch up jobs, you know, they bring people on right before the movie shoots to go, can you make this any funnier, right? Yeah. That's the best and cheapest way to do it. You mm -hmm. add the jokes in before the cameras start rolling, right? Yes. Then the two things that people tend to do after the fact, if a movie isn't working and plot points are messy or you need more jokes or whatever, are how much of this can we fix in editing and ADR, right? Because, right. you know, we can't change too much of it. Or we only have the budget and the schedule to do like one week of reshoots. If we could only add five scenes, what are the five scenes we need to add or less or more or right. whatever, right? And this is like, it's like they hand it to him and he went, well, if I was there on the day, I would have done this, but obviously we can't. And then went like, no, don't any pitch anything. We'll fix it in CGI. Like it's, they, it's like it was an animated movie where he was like, yeah, but I can't change that now. And they were like, you can. We can bring Affleck in, put him in front of a green screen. It's a year and a half later. His drinking problems have risen again. But we'll get the <laughs> one line from him and then edit it into a previous conversation. And you're talking about Batman feeling different. This Affleck has said like he was supposed to do his solo Batman movie that he right. wrote and directed right after this. And he stepped down. And the story that he said recently in interviews is he showed the script to a friend and they went, he went, I don't know. Do you think I should do this? And they said, I think the script is good. I think you could get, make a good movie. I think if you go through this Batman thing again, you're literally going to drink yourself to death after what wow. happened on Justice League. And you do feel like he, there's there's a very specific performance in BVS, right? And then yes. here is like he's a little bit responding to the negativity of BVS and he's trying to get a little bit lighter. Right. Yeah. And then Justice League is the, the Whedon version is like watching a man who is just dead inside is regretting this. Why did I do Daredevil again? <laughs> right, I won an yeah. Oscar. What am I doing here? You know? I am now right. an established director. And by the way, trusting a guy that he worked with on Argo, too. Like I, I you feel like, OK, I, I'm I'm I've protected myself in every possible way. Yeah. And now I've been someone pulled the carpet right out from under me. And yeah. And, and screwed me over. This is the one other thing I want to say about the, the weirdness of this night not being a complete vision even still is the plan was Chris Terrio had written two complete scripts. There was justice league part one and justice league part two. They were going to be shot back to back. Right. And with the, the trepidation after BVS, they went, let's pull the brakes. Only do one now do two later. So what we're watching now is the four hour cut of what was only supposed to be the first half of a two-part movie. There's still right. a whole second half they never got to. And I think in some ways... 
like the reshoots and some re-editing and effect stuff he's done, he's tried to retrofit some of the stuff he would have done in part two into this movie. But like Dark Side was not even supposed to be in this this much. Oh, I think they wow. added more Dark Side. He was just supposed to be like even less. And then two was Dark Side, right? The end of one is I, uh, Stephen I believe he, he has kind of talked about there being three like movies, but yes. So I think there, there were was definitely third, two scripts well, the, ready there were to two, go. Though. Right. They were, they had this back to back plan. They also had, you know, like the Riddler was in the bat, bat uh, Ben Affleck movie and he was going to like solve the anti-life equation. You know, there was a lot of like track oh, laid wow. that they then dynamited, but yeah. The only thing they reshot for this movie uh, with people, uh, obviously, and it was I, Jim. It was Jim. To be clear, it was Jim Carrey's Riddler. It, yes, <laughs> of course, he yes. was back. Yeah, he was back. It was, was Jim. He's back. back. Yeah, uh, all the classic yeah. Jim Carrey characters coming back in the Warner Brothers canon. Right, he had the popcorn machine mind reading <laughs> thing. Yeah, the epilogue uh, is the major reshoot. That, right, that's like no, the no, no. It's the, it's the only reshoot. They shot three days to do that epilogue. Now they may have added other stuff with CG or whatever. But I, that's I, the think only that, I think that I think that the they flashback scene is. Oh, I think the flashback scene with Darkseid is a, a reshoot, but because it's not human act, I think it's right. all CGI. They did a so lot that, of like, CGI yeah. motion capture stuff uh, right, right, with Darkseid right, right. and Steppenwolf. Yeah. Right. They and, fully and also, redesigned Steppenwolf. I mean, they yeah. just, yeah, on, they an, gave him uh, just on an effects level. Pants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, they redesigned stuff. They made the, you know, the, all the, and, and I will say, and uh, I liked all of the dark side, introducing dark side and letting there be a bigger bad than just Steppenwolf and the parademons was beneficial. It made, it gave context to, to yeah. Steppenwolf and why he's doing what he's doing. Also like in the Whedon cut, I don't understand what mother boxes are at all. And in this one, <laughs> in the Snyder Cut, the only reason I mostly do is because uh, Wonder Woman uh, does a three and a half minute exposition dump to Bruce Wayne. She's like, well, I think I, all I can tell is, and then she talks for three and a half minutes <laughs> based exclusively, I believe, on cave painting. Yeah. 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 I think her yes. knowledge, yes. Her, her minutes <laughs> worth of knowledge is from looking at like pictographs. I was like, what is scare. This? They understand. They go, they go deep. Yeah. I mean, they she's an antiquities expert. Yeah. Damn By it. the way, I I do want to talk about that. Like there is something like, there are in the good way. There are very funny things in this movie still. Yes. Like when she is in that museum wearing what looks to me like a, like an outfit that you might wear on a, a premiere or something. she's yes. wearing like a very form fitting, like white, it just a gorgeous, like you would see Pristine, it in clean cut, not yeah, the kind she, of thing you take to work where you restore art, uh, where you, you got like a, a chisel sculpture. and a brush. And she's <laughs> not in any, no, like there's no smock over it. There's no, <laughs> there's nothing. It's just like, I'm, <laughs> it did make me like, that, that is an odd choice. That is an odd choice. He makes odd choices. <laughs> the, I honestly, the thing that most surprised me in terms of when you're watching this, I honestly figured that the Whedon had added in the Wonder Woman museum rescue sequence because that yeah. felt so tacked on and it's plays better in this kind of. Uh, That's a, I, I'm sorry. My biggest surprise. I was a hundred percent certain that Whedon had tacked on the cyborg and flash go grave digging and bond sequence yes yes, yes me i too. could yes, not yes. believe that that was in the original cut and not only that's like 12 minutes and all of right. them are there few few things were surprising but that was i right. thought that was surprising as well only because whedon you know with Buff, buffy has spent so much time in graveyards yes, yes. Loves it's like graveyard. why it's like one of his it's one of his signature settings yes. yeah to him it's like frazier's recording booth in frazier <laughs> <Right>. a great <laughs> uh, yes yes it's central park he just thought this yes, is a good it's central park <laughs> set to have some characters share funny quips that, that i mean Gu gunter was in there gunter was in he's in, in, in the Snyder. Grave. that's in the snyder cut that's what's so weird is but, gunter all is just CGI. there in the graveyard. He but is CGI. All fully CGI. Right, but I, let's, I mean, because we, we've talked a lot about the movie, like the general sense of the movie. Let's talk about this epilogue because that is the new footage. Like that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. this, I think what you're talking about, this idea of like this is throwing towards the overall vision. I think that there's a couple moves here uh, that he is basically going like, this is what we were going to do. And now 
suck it. Like, you know, like I think that that like, yeah. or maybe making a play to be like, let me take the Justice League in my own world. And now I will exist separately from this and let me go make my things. And I think you should make them exclusively for HBO Max. But that ending, I'm going to go in the most suspect of Jared Leto being in this ending as the Joker. I'm going to go in and I got to say, I was even... Like, I was like, am I, am I, is it four hours and two minutes? Like, am I three hours and 15 minutes in and going, am I worn down? I, but I kind of like this. Stockholm situ- Syndrome? Yeah. But I like right. this. I like the scene. I like the scene okay. between Batman and Joe. Okay. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about this. I, well, here's, I just want to say something. We're, we're I want to hear point Griffin's talking take on about this. this is the second to last ending in the movie, right? Yes. Right. So, the movie so we're is, talking, yeah. I believe it's, is it called Nightfall? Uh, uh, it's the nightmare, nightmare with a K. Nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. with a K. Yeah. Yes, nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the epi- now because the movie ends. It fully ends. You see right. every hero, you know, has rediscovered their sense of purpose. You see the Flash running. You see Superman opening his shirt. You know, right? Like it's Everyone's the ending. Happy. And then yeah. it's like and twenty more minutes. You know, and whereas like okay. I do think. The movie would be better as a movie if it actually ended at the ending, at Superman sure. opening his shirt. The epilogue feels, like you say, more like Snyder kind of being like, and look, here's a bunch of stuff I had planned. Right. Yeah. In- interested? You know? His whoa, yeah. whoa. big picture yeah. plan was, like, by all accounts, movie one was Steppenwolf, right? Teeing up mm-hmm. movie two, Dark Side, that's the escalation. Uh, yes, movie, movie three, three is was evil Nightmare. Superman. Right, yes, like his whole like, thing was, because yeah. you see this in BVS, it's the first of the two dream sequences that then amounts to Flash showing up and saying, I'm too early, right? It's, yeah. He was so <laughs> obsessed with this alternate timeline of, and he's made this clear now, but Warner Brothers shot it down. The thing was supposed to be that... Batman slept with Lois Lane. And say cucks. Lois Lane. Say cucks. Batman, Batman cucks Superman. Cucks that Superman. was his pitch. Yes. Right. And then <laughs> Superman goes apocalyptic and it creates just a horrible hellscape for everybody. So that's what he was working towards. You see that in BVS. And then I think he just was like, well, I'm never going to get to make my other two movies unless I leave people salivating at the end of this one. It's a grand play. I mean, it does yeah. make sense. It's like he knows the movie is finished. So he tacks on truly the next time, the next time on the, the yes. end of like, it's it yeah. really it's is. a teaser. It's, he yeah. ends it's the, Lex, the, movie. the Lex Luthor sequence and then the dream sequence right. of the future. And then the Martian Manhunter saying like, by the way, Bruce, great job. See you later. When was that, by the way, when was that Joe? Because I remember Joe Manganiello, there was like a post that maybe Ben they, Affleck they put. Yeah, in the Whedon one, and, and they established part. Deathstroke. Right. Yeah. Um, it's different a little bit it's in this weird. one. It's weird. There, there's a lot of examples of this in the movie where having watched the two cuts pretty close together, yeah. too close together. Um <laughs> There are a lot of examples where it's like, oh, this wasn't reshot by Whedon, but they just chose different lines from the same scene. Like, yeah. or the ADR different responses. Yeah, right. I don't know, but it, but it is like the the dialogue in the Mangianello Eisenberg ending in the Whedon cut is entirely different, but it clearly wasn't reshot. That one, the whole buildup is it's time we build a league of our own. Yeah, and this right. one, it's Batman's right. Bruce Wayne. Go do the yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. and we. Should and, and Madonna from A League of Their Own is in the scene. And yeah, and she's, she's in by the way, scene. And right. she's good. And, and you know, and Lex, really Lex good. Luthor is really like, good. there's no crying yeah. in he villainy. Yes. Um, and I he will, says that. <laughs> right. It's true. I, uh, I will say that Red Letter Media did this thing that I loved where they were breaking down Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And in the trailer of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the Indiana Jones, uh, the, the Shia LaBeouf Indiana mm-hmm. Jones movie, um, you know, he's like Shia LaBeouf, like in the trailer, yells up to Indy, like, you're a teacher. And he looks down really badass and he's like, part time, you know, part like, time. like, you know, like and then part in the time. movie, he says it like part time. Like, yeah, it, like, it, it's a very it's like the trailer has the better delivery of the right. line. that You're like, yeah. And and the movie, it's like. And you watch the movie, you're like, wait, wait, why did you pick that? You had it. You had you have it. And that's what this movie feels like. It's like, well, you had it, right? Why would you right. why would you and go that, over here? That's like, the most surprising thing is when you watch it and you're like, oh, they they had all those pieces. It's not like that was a thing he reshot. They just chose the worst takes and the worst yeah. lines to keep in. Um 
uh, what was I going to say though? You, oh, you yes. have the, you have the Eisenberg uh, Manginella thing, which was shot mm. at the time by Snyder, right? And then the other two prologues were the two things he shot new for this. Now, I did read an interview with him where he said that um, his original plan was he wanted to be Green Lantern at yes. the yes. end of the movie. Yeah. And it yeah. was first he wanted Ryan Reynolds, Hal Jordan. Yeah. And then that was just like a non-starter. So then it right. was, I want a different Green Lantern. I'll work with Warner Brothers. We can pick which character it is and who's playing them. And they went along with it for a while and then said, J.J. Abrams is going to do this big Green Lantern HBO series. We want to keep that clean. Can you change it? So uh, the Affleck side of that was shot with the assumption right. that they would film a Green Lantern later or do it with CGI. I understand. My understanding is he shot a Green Lantern um, with a gun. And then it, <laughs> yeah, he shot a Green Lantern with a gun. But he was drinking. And he said, "Fine, if nobody, if I can't do Green Lantern, <laughs> nobody can do Green Lantern." <laughs> but wait, yeah. my my thought was, and why I really liked the the final end reveal of the Martian Manhunter and, and mm -hmm. how they seated in the beginning is that that character has been established throughout all of yep. the Zack right. Snyder films. He's so in felt Man of Steel, right. Right. right, which felt to me like, oh, well, that's way more interesting that Martian Manhunter has been here affecting, sure. you know, like, I, I just feel like that was maybe yeah. one of those happy accidents because it makes he, the movie look way more complete. He shot the thing with uh, Lois and Martha during the original shoot and had storyboarded okay, yes. that when she walks out, turns into Martian Manhunter. And then that was cut even before he got pushed off the movie like that got was it, right. they never did the effect so he was able to salvage that and the seeds had been planted yeah the, here's the here's my big question to you guys though look i think like well everything we're saying here this movie is four hours long i think there is a three hour version of this movie that is theatrically viable right mm -hmm. obviously well Arnold brothers is never going to release a four hour movie but you can there's th this movie is full of sequences that you would horse trade with a studio where they're like, can we take out the Icelandic folk song? Yes. <laughs> no, you know, yeah. no, you no. can't. I, I, look, I'm not David, saying like, no. <laughs> okay. David, how saying, dare you? That's like my favorite part. My like, favorite part of the movie is like the Icelandic I, dirge. Look, she I smells the sweater. Can I keep, look, keep, can I keep four of the seven slow-mo sequences? Four of right. the seven. But right. just like, here's the, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Speed up any slow-mo yes. just a little you bit. You save 30 mm. minutes right there. Yeah. He, he's, he speed ramps within slow-mo. He will yes. speed, he'll go, <laughs> like, anyway, sorry, go ahead. Here's go ahead. my question. Here's my question. Okay. Okay. So every time... Um, Aquaman walks out of the ocean like when he when he rescues the guy off the boat, right? Mm -hmm. He rescues the guy off the boat, he brings mm -hmm. him in, and he throws him on the table. Aquaman is wearing a shirt. Where did he get that shirt? Because then when he walks, he doesn't take off his. Boots. Then when he walks out, he takes it off always and jumps in the water. Yeah. So he's got an opportunity between jumping on land to <laughs> grab a shirt that he's only going to wear while he's on land because then he got to get rid of it. He does that twice. He's got in like the movie. drop boxes all across the planet. He's got like shirt piles. He's got shirts because <laughs> yeah. he also he doesn't leave the shirt there and be like, "Hey, I'm going to pick this shirt up later." He tosses it into the ocean. Yeah, the girl. The girls, uh, the the women of the town, take a shirt. They take it like they sniff it. They, they sniff, sniff it. his sweater. They sniff I mean, maybe they I place would. it in, in places. But I guess my thought is, what would you rather have on a wet shirt or wet boots? Because just kick the boots off. Like at, at a certain <laughs> yes. point, like you're walking, and I mean, I know it's rocky there. Um, I will ask this about because uh, we're, <laughs> we're kind of picking some parts of it. Um, do you believe? that the cameo in the Aquaman world was intentional. I, I believe it was, and the cameo that I'm talking about is the drummer from uh, from the uh, from the fire battle, and I'm talking about the octopus. The octopus yes, got right. a nice uh, yes. close-up in this, and, you know, last time we saw him, he was playing the drums, yeah, uh, and this time drums. we... <laughs> I did much like I much like in the Little Mermaid, how <laughs> Sebastian the Crab, the court composer, is a crucial member of like <laughs> policy making. It yeah. seems like the the drumming octopus in you the know Aquaman what, David, world. David, I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to let you get a plug in for <laughs> the recent blank check uh, uh, <laughs> mini series. It's just about to me, the that's Disney all. animated films, including Little Mermaid. Right. The hot crustacean band, yeah. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. And what? And one other one other thing I want to bring up that is an odd. We talked about like bad choices. Amber Heard in the Whedon one, no oh, accent. 
I Amber can't. This is one. bizarre. This Amber is bizarre. Heard in Aquaman, no accent. Yes. What? That's the thing that pushes it over the edge. Like, I was trying to do the math on this. I'm like, is it possible she shot it with a British accent? When Whedon came on, he was like, she should be American. They ADR'd it because the footage is shared largely. Yes. Yes. They must have ADR'd it. And then when Juan makes his Aquaman film, they're like, well, the one that got released, she had an American accent, so let's go with that. I, I will say this. I think her dropping the accent was the right call. I think she I agree. is I agree. more comfortable well, look, in the part with the American accent. Yeah. Defoe but, uh, doesn't have yeah. an accent. There's, there's no, no world building no. where we're saying it's like Star Wars. The Imperials are that's for the most part. That is, you know, they're played primarily by British actors, you know, with some exceptions. Um, but there's no like the Aquaman world is not doesn't have that same kind of a thing. No, no. It ends up being a funny Star Wars thing where it's like, why does Princess Leia have a British accent for that one scene and then never again? You know? Yeah. It's, where it's it, like it, this it, weird remnant <laughs> of like, it's well, it's so bizarre. Um, let's talk about this epilogue too. Because I mean, I know we keep on dancing around. So yeah. this epilogue, he takes, I mean, this is again, what I think is the master stroke of this movie where he says, I think Zack Snyder says, um, hey, you know the character that is universally hated the most in the DCU? I'm going to put him in this movie and make him palatable. Like, mm. that to me felt like the biggest fuck you. It's not a fuck you to Joss Whedon. It's a fuck you to, like, I don't know, every, like, it's almost like I am the rightful heir. Like, it's like, the, like he has come home to yeah. roost by putting Jared Leto in this thing and directing him the way he does and giving that scene between the two of them. Let's say, though, this is fundamentally, for all intents and purposes, a different character, right? Like, not only has he so thoroughly yes. changed the look of this character, got rid of all the visual stuff, which is the right. easiest is no stuff to clown on. An evil club owner or whatever. He is, right, yes. but also yeah, like he's no longer Joker. like covered in tattoos. Right, and, he doesn't have to like, damaged in the grill. He doesn't and shit. look like yeah. he's a. Yeah. He doesn't look like he's a DJ at right. all. <laughs> right, and Leto's like has a different energy. He's doing a different voice. Like it feels like yeah. Snyder going. I'm gonna just reset and give you another chance to play the Joker. Is there anything you like want to do vindic- differently? Like he he saves Jared Leto in this whole mix. Like he goes like he's like I'm gonna bring you back in and in my like rebirth. I'm saving you. It's it's a very selfless act in a way. Yeah, it was dangerous. <laughs> Can I ask you guys a question? In that scene, in that team up that we see in the the um this dystopian future that in if for all intents and purposes would have been i'm assuming the next movie mm-hmm. and you can tell yep. like you you can tell how on board ben affleck is for the potential oh, of what yeah. could have been simply because he shows up for all of this reshoot yeah, yeah. he's the, he's he commits to doing all of these extra days yeah. to just shoot this stuff anyway when that team, when they kind of run through that team and Deathstroke's on that team and Joker's in there. And so it's, it British is a, Mara. it is, yeah, it's a suicide <laughs> yep. squad ask. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, a group of he- heroes and villains. Was that Flash Ezra Miller? Yes. 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 It was. Okay. He just has, yeah. okay. he has his like time travel armor. That, right. That's, that's the there. costume yeah. he wore in Batman v Superman, right? right? That's it's, how yes. he looks in that weird dream sequence where he okay. comes back. That's to what Warren. I wanted to make. Cause yeah. I was like, are they telling, are they, are they intimating that this is a different flash? But okay. That makes sense. That's fine. Okay. Wait, this is the question yeah. I was kind of wanting to ask. Say this movie comes out in a three hour cut. It's this movie, a little chopped down. That's all. I'm sorry about the Icelandic folk song, Jason. But I'm just saying, like, Zack Snyder's That's Justice still League. your cut, David? Oh, look, 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 just give me a second here. Comes out in 2017. I think this movie would have gotten fairly bad reviews. And yeah, I think you know, it would have not, flopped. Nothing, I think it, I think it would have had similar box office Done okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I think that people in 2017 would have been like, no, we don't like this tone. Like, we already told you. You're doubling down on it. Like, there would have been a little more pushback. It's setting up a future apocalypse, then the Flash is going to have to travel through time to save it, which is something Marvel literally does, like, right around the same mm-hmm. time yeah. with their universe. I think people would have rejected it. I think the time, you know, the sort of Snyder weird kind of transformation into an underdog 
same with Affleck, same with like a lot of the people in this movie. Like people kind of have come around on Henry Cavill a lot more. The Ray then. Fisher you know, stuff, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Ray, you know, like there's just a lot of rooting for this movie. Yeah, exactly. It's so crazy. But that I went this, in I, also going like I'm not a fan of. Like, I did not like Batman v Superman. I watched sure. Justice League. I found it to be boring. Like, and I was, and we picked it for this podcast before it came out because it was like, it will be an interesting conversation on whatever, like on this level or Good, it was bad. terrible. Right. 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 But uh, so I guess I'm saying is like, I did go in maybe leaning more towards critical, less towards, like, I was like, how could this possibly yeah. be good? How could it be good? But then how I saw it was good. I agree with you, though. I don't think this hits in the theater, but I, no. it's, it's like, I didn't in go 2017. in. In 2017. In 2017, yeah. Here's, yeah. here's what I'll say. I'll, I'll say on top of that is, you know, yes, 2017, one year into the Trump presidency, like, mm-hmm. do not even, like, are we going to want this dystopian no. worldview? Right. And the answer is yeah. categorically no. Yeah. We don't want, like, this, I think the only reason any of us are reacting positively to it at all is simply because it's an improvement on something that was legitimately unintelligibly very bad the, the, yeah. the now, framing helps this movie in so many ways it not just when we're does. seeing it how much emotionality has built up in most uh, multiple different storylines of people working on the movie mm-hmm. the you know warranted uh weed and backlash like all these sorts of things but also it's literally i just think the way he presents this movie the fact that it's on hbo max after a year of lockdown we all haven't seen sure. movies, which is one of the only reasons i really think this movie got to to be made in this yes, form. Yes, 100%. Yeah. They had a, yeah. a, a multi million. Yeah. yeah. Right. That they were like, we need to drive subscribers to HBO Max, and also we can't produce that much. We're willing to put $70 million into something that will function like a blockbuster. Whereas before, I think we would have been lucky if we had gotten a release that was more like the uh, Richard Donner Superman 2 cut, where it's like, oh, we're giving you an indication of what it could have looked like, but none of this is really finished. Yeah. yeah. What, I, what, I, what I feel like, though, is inside. It whether it was in 2017 right now we're you're right we're all predisposed to look more favorably on this in 2017 i would have been so disappointed yes. because for me this this doesn't look like my understanding of the justice league this no, right. these are movies like 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 it's no what's what's absolutely categorically true in all of these instances is every time they are showing themiscara it's fantastic because Zack Snyder's style works because so, it looks like 300. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It works mm-hmm. so well in that hand to hand armored kind of individualized combat. And once they get into all of the cities, all of the destruction, all of the death, all of the grief and mourning, once once all of these characters are killing people, they are responsible for near genocides. These are these are these are the characters are so dark, dystopian and suffused with his Ayn Randian kind of nihilistic worldview that like I don't I didn't want it then and I'm certain I wouldn't have wanted even a coherent three hour cut of this I would have been like yeah the movie made sense but I didn't enjoy it but can I maybe let me offer this I think we also and again the 2017 version I, I agree with all everything we were saying but I also believe that I don't know and this is a weird thing to say and I maybe so Jump on me if I'm saying it the wrong way. I think you can be a great filmmaker who also is better served in a world like HBO Max. Like you don't yeah. have to. Like, I, and there's yeah. something about that where I'm like, like Damon Lindelof doing The Watchmen. Like he could only tell that story on HBO. I love The Watchmen, but that's not a movie, right? Like, the, and yes. this is not a movie. It's, it's it not. is, but it's, it's not. It, the framing also helps different. with literally yeah. putting in like the chapter titles, having it be so egregiously long putting yeah. it in a weird aspect ratio. Like it does feel like all of this stuff is sort of laying out the track of like, you need to view this differently. This is the very weird specific analogy. I kept on thinking about watching this movie and being so surprised that I was sort of being won over by it. And I do want to say, I mean, to Jason's point, like a thing I just categorically hate in this movie is just how fucking 
gray it is. Like watching mm-hmm. the Whedon cut, I was like, this is the absolute worst execution of more what I would want a Justice League movie to be versus this movie, which is like the best execution of what I don't necessarily want That's out of a Justice League w- movie, well but I have put. to respect right. it more. And you look at like the original trailers for Justice League, the color timing is right in the middle. And then when Whedon came on, brightened everything saturated the colors and then when Snyder took back over it went back down to grayscale I hate that Steppenwolf is gray that all the parademons are gray that most of the team is gray that they fight an underground like pipeline that's gray and the final battle <laughs> happens in a city that's gray like it's just right this whereas the Whedon so... movie it's a city that's red right like they, yeah, and Superman puts on a suit right, that is black. Right, super, yes. black, black with, with a gray. Why would you S. change that? Why yeah. would you change that fucking suit? Like, yeah. why would you put it? Like, it's such a great moment, and it uh, yeah, yeah, it's it like it's so it speaks to the character. I love. Look, I like all these characters more, but again, I think it all just goes to he is telling a large scale HBO miniseries. A yeah. lot, like, he's telling a different thing. Mm-hmm. Not for nothing. He's about. Yes. They're about to release a black and white they version are, right? which, of the I, Snyder I, cut. I, once again, I'm wow. I'm sort of just like I guess that's better. Like I just want him to go all the way with all this fucking. <laughs> shit. Do your thing. Like do right. Like, that, I think right. we like he. Right. They're, they're trying to like Warner Brothers. It seems like Warner Brothers is putting people in a box, and what they've yeah. found is a that mother box. A mother box oh, uh, is that it doesn't work. It's like when you put Todd, like let Todd Phelps make. His Joker. You didn't want yeah. to make that. It gets Academy Awards. And I'm not talking about the quality of that movie or whatever. But you want you know you 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 make your Aquaman. You you let your you let everyone. And I think Margot Robbie, uh, as much as uh, is it Kathy Yan who made uh, yes. Birds of Prey? Yeah. Yep. Like, I think Margot Robbie is 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 so uh, held on to that character as much as like, I think they take control and they're like this is the story that we want to tell and yeah. everything starts to feel like there's more ownership and that's when Marvel works. Like Marvel works with ownership it doesn't work with this is what marvel's doing we need to copy this it needs to be two hours it needs to be that this is another framing thing that i think helps this movie a lot now versus watching it four years ago right which is dc has i think very wisely decided their approach is we're gonna do the anti-marvel we cannot do this unified thing what we're gonna do is Anything goes. We'll have five versions of the same character yeah. between TV and animation and movies at the same time. It doesn't matter, right? Like, let's yeah. just own the variety of these characters, which it's a thing like if it's if like comic these, books, right? You go on the yeah. shelves and it's like there are four different Batman titles. They're all written by different people and different artists. And one of them's for kids and one of them's like a vertigo title, or whatever. Yeah. Like do that. Throw caution to the wind. I think I was bummed out with these Snyder movies when they came out because I was like, Ugh, these are going to be the versions of Superman right, and Batman right. for a generation. Aside from the fact that it felt kind of like gatekeepy to make these versions of these characters that are fundamentally not for kids, right? Like that are so in your face, like this is intense. Right. This is not for fucking kids. And not only that, I wish it was rated R. I fucking resent I, you babies. I that think you're really right. Out. That's that's the bummer with, you know, Batman v Superman right. is like Batman and Superman are responsible, f- are, are murderers. Right. And they're Batman like, and Superman are straight up murderers. They're also like and, sad assholes. Yes. And they're and they're they are all of them confronting the issues of adults. Right. They are all yes. confronting the issues of adults or God. They're also movies and that like, feel like <laughs> fundamentally they would be boring to children. Like it's yes, not just they that are. This is above them. Or scary. Right. But now you, know? you watch this like five years later and you're like, well, this is Zack Snyder's Justice League. This is so not taking variety, up any yeah. real estate. It's not it's not the uh, variety removing. is making it maybe so maybe yes. that's what it is. Like we are we have now accepted that you can have the hilarious Harley Quinn animated show right. you can have so all good. these things that yeah so funny and so that, great that can live yeah maybe that is also the case I, it's that's like huge oh for me. this is just yeah. gonna be like Zack Snyder like, and I think what happened was and maybe for better or for worse like Zack Snyder's vision was 
influencing uh, Suicide Squad. Was in like everyone mm-hmm. had to buy into this world, and the minute they broke with that, mm-hmm. they've had success. But you can also live in Zack Snyder's world, but he's not the Feige because there isn't a right. Feige. There doesn't that, need to be a Feige. That's the other thing, right? Like yeah. a, there's more diversity in how these characters get represented in different mediums. He's no longer claiming squatters rights over I get to be the only person doing Superman and Batman and everything. And then the second thing is the movies have broken out of this so much that you're like, this is no longer casting a shadow over everything. Yes. If Shazam can exist and be that cartoonish, then I don't care if Snyder makes his movies this bleak. Right. But but the thing I keep thinking about is I, I have a friend named Christopher Compton who has been writing this like fantasy universe since he was like 10 years old. It's what he would write in school when he was bored and it's like all like his whole life experience, his relationship to his parents and stuff. He's just been working on it for like decades, right? And once a year, he'll like have a party it, during the summer. I just follow me here for five seconds where he like stands in front of a captive audience and he tries to explain the universe as much as he can. Right. And people go like, so who's that person? And he goes like, OK. And he's like chain smoking. Right. And he's sort of like gesturing like there's a map. And I got invited to one of these once. And I said to my friend, like, this thing's fucking amazing. He has to write a book. And it's like, it's impossible. He can't do it. This doesn't exist in any linear narrative form. This is this like wide ranging sort of like idea. that. So he's it's had. an oral history. It's an I oral history this. of a universe that doesn't exist. And fundamentally, amazing. the only form it can exist in is this guy in a backyard chain smoking trying to conquer like 10% of it like every time he does this only 10% of it gets covered and it's it's decided by what people are asking him to focus on right oh, I love this and there's a purity oh, of amazing. it where you're just like the only way this can exist is in this for- there's no way you could wiggle this into What's a book George or R. even a Martin it's, or right. like it's like yes. it has to be like it has to be this this explosion over multiple books and right. thousands of pages and and you know it's it's even like you know Tolkien with the like you know the similar uh similarion you know whatever yeah. that, you and know, this like, movie is the same thing where it's like it's still only one third of the movie he wanted to make at twice the length of what DC wanted for one movie and the thing doesn't really function like a movie it doesn't have traditional narrative proportion. well I mean did any of us watch it straight through I could not no no I not. did but I really? I zoned out for the last 45 minutes and then rewatched every from- time there was a chapter break <laughs> yeah. I took that opportunity to stop mm. go do something whatever come back start it again I fell asleep sometimes I started watching it I late at night asleep. I fell asleep but I, I fell asleep because there is like I was watching it late at night, but like it does, I think, require like a reset. And I think those breaks are in there for a reason, because yeah, yeah, it, it, it can get like I know this is like we're saying I'm saying two things out of the side of my mouth. It's like it can get numbing at a certain point, too, because it is like, yeah, it is a sort sure. of. But I think the refreshing I when I watch it more like what you said, Jason, where I took breaks in between chapters I was like, oh, I can. I can enjoy this 40 minutes. For, it's basically enjoying like three 40-minute movies, and it feels incredibly digestible that way, but almost insurmountable in like, okay, more slow-mo, more this, more music, more that, yeah. Right. Yeah. So the one thing I want to bring up to you all is what I have found uh, a little bit on our How Did This Get Made Discord, and I made a post about the Snyder Cut, and I found this to be true as well. This is a 50-50 movie. People love it Mm. or they hate it. And I want to acknowledge that other percent, people who probably already tuned out by this point, but the hate for this movie, this Snyder Cut film is real. Like, and I want to also remember, like, how do we even, like, I don't know if I totally get it. Do you feel like that hate, I mean, I'm just, I'm curious uh, because I'm, I haven't looked at it or anything, but do you feel like that hate is bi- is basically hatred towards why we have the Snyder Cut more about how how the toxic fandom kind of no, I, I needled it, and cajoled and mm. threatened and bullied its way into getting this movie released? It, it, this, or is it, I watched this, I hated it? Uh, like, this is like... 
you know, people hate the introduction of the Flash scene, you know. uh, Oh, see, that was, I was blown. Okay, so that's a perfect example of, I was blown away that they took that scene out. The the introduction to the Flash, um, also, I I want to, uh, because David has it as his background, so I want to call it out. This movie fully rips off the idea of pocket dogs that I pioneered <laughs> that I that I pioneered on the TV show The League. Mm, yep. The Flash takes a hot dog out of midair, puts it in his pocket for mm. later, i.e. a pocket dog. You're welcome, uh Zack Snyder. You can you I guess you can steal from the best. But um <laughs> that scene is such a good um, incredible set piece to introduce us to this new character. I'm I was blown out that they took it out. You got also Kiersey Clemens as Iris West was took, amazing right, as Iris. Right. Yeah, 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 very uh, nice little who, performance. Who is now coming back? Right, because I mean there were like right. she's two cast new stories in last the Flash week. Movie. She right, is coming yeah. back for the Flash movie, but Crudup is not. Weird. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know yeah. what happened there. Yeah. But what what I was gonna say is like, here's a great explanation of why some people hate this movie, right? Snyder is just so specific in what he does. It's one of the reasons I rewatched Dawn of the Dead this last week because that's very much my favorite movie of his. But that's the one movie where it's like. It's a James Gunn script. It's got all this James Gunn in it. And he was very much a director for hire trying to show off and do a snazzy job. But it's not a movie that's in the same way as I would argue pretty much every other film in his filmography. So reflective of his worldview and all of his aesthetic interests. Right. And I just feel like when you make choices this specific, it's going to piss some people off, which it generally has for me. I just go like this guy's not my flavor. Right. Mm -hmm. But you get to a scene like that, which is like really good in and of itself is really kind of elegant character development introduction. Um, But, like, you can start pulling apart threads of just, like, and this is a thought I kept on having. The guy fucking loves slow-mo, right? He just thinks everything looks cooler in slow-mo. He cannot resist but use it anytime. He also uses snow-mo. He uses snow-mo as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is when uh, he puts snow into the movie. Snow, yeah, yeah, there's just yeah. it, there's just inexplicably snow inside of the se- the right. set pieces. Right. Yeah. Um. But uh, you realize like okay, strategically, if you've decided that the way you're going to visualize the Flash's powers is that he goes into slow motion, right? That everything is slowed down around him, you have the lightning. Then maybe don't use slow-mo the rest of the movie. Maybe that's the visual language you've decided on. That's the visual power set for this character. Maybe you can't do it every time Connie Nielsen fucking takes her sword out. Well, then what what you have then is essentially what, you know, and they, they cheat it, but any sequence that has slow-mo as a part of it in which the Flash is also inside that sequence, mm-hmm. I believe the Flash should, should appear as though he's either at a complete standstill or he should be invisible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, like he should be. He should appear to be actually at a complete standstill right. because of the the the, the double com- combination of the visual language of the Flash is slow motion and the language of the film is slow motion. So it should appear as though he's just standing stock still. But that's why this is. It is easy to hate this movie because you start pulling at any one thread like this, and it all just kind of completely falls apart. Well, I guess you're apart. right. Well, it's yeah, like that like, idea yes. that the Atlanteans can only talk to each other if they create an air bubble around themselves right. so that they can use their vocal cords. Wait, what? They, they, you know, so they... Yeah. Which they dumped for Aquaman wisely. Like, there's stuff yeah. like that yeah. that they dumped for Aquaman. There's the thing... There's certain... Like, there's this moment I saw it sort of going around on Twitter and it is hilarious when Superman returns, Snyder cuts to the cop pulling his gun like going yes. like, wait yeah. a second. Where I'm like, is your plan one? Why are you pulling a gun? Two, your plan is to shoot Superman. Like you know, like yeah, you right. literally like that. are. You literally are the security guard guarding <laughs> Superman's <laughs> memorial. So you would arguably know you more about Superman dead? than anyone. Right. Like yeah, right. Or like so you also understand that he has these powers that are pretty <laughs> amazing. 
<laughs> he he has people make choices every step. Every every character has makes choices that are so. When Joe Morton, like when he and um, Cyborg are having their kind of back and forth, and Joe Morton is like, "Don't you understand? I've given you all of this power. I've given you all this access. There's so much you can do. You've barely scratched the surface of what you could do." He says, "You are in. You have access to the entire nuclear arsenal." Yeah. I was like, okay. "Wait, what?" Okay. Why? Why? Look, Wait, this Joe is, Morton. Why did you do that? Why? You should not have. <laughs> he, you have this, an angry this, this teenager. Kid, yeah. Look, put, this kid is very unstable right now, put based some on what you've put him through. Parental locks on there. Joe oh, Martin. by the way, yeah. speaking about speaking about like losing a shirt and putting a shirt on, Cyborg is dropping that sweatshirt <laughs> off and on. And like, how many Gotham uh, sweatshirts does he have? Hoodies Look, does he have? There is a sequence in this movie that, I, if you're talking about this as being a fifty-fifty thing where Cyborg sees a poor family in need at the ATM and uses yeah. his Cyborg powers to give them money. And I've seen people say, like, this was one of my favorite parts of the movie. I love that this was included. And I've seen people say, like, that was so dumb. What the hell is going on in that sequence? And I kind of came down on both sides. Where, like, on one side, I kind of, I, you know, I just generally liked, obviously, that this movie actually gives Cyborg an arc and lots to do. And like you say, he's kind of the heart of the movie and his whole relationship with everyone is very crucial. But at the same time, I'm also like, wait, he can redistribute wealth? Are we... Yeah. Why even care about Steppenwolf? Just right. work on that. Right. Don't even go to fucking Moscow or wherever. Uh, just uh, uh, you, uh, yes. you, wait a second, Cyborg. How powerful are you? Yeah, it really does. It, it makes us understand, though, that like... I'm a, I guess what we're to understand is like he's still just a teenager. But, right. And yes. so he's yeah. like, you know. He's dipping his toe. Are you saying that it's easier? Well, the movie says it is easier for Cyborg to redistribute wealth than to <laughs> fix Batman's plane. Correct. Because that one takes a, <laughs> yeah. a lot longer. Or, or to, to fix a uh, personal tape recorder. Oh, yeah. Y yes. Right. There's stuff. But then there's stuff like there's an arc for Batman's gauntlets in this movie. A whole arc. Oh, like, my God. Uh, spanning hours of the movie. Mm. There's stuff yeah. like that that uh, I kind of have to applaud the four hour maximalist ridiculousness of that. But I can also hop over the line and be like, right. That that that's dumb. You know, like I yeah, I can like, see right. both arguments on this. Here's another thing. He puts two Nick Cave songs in the movie, both of which have <laughs> lyrics that seemingly describe what is happening on screen. Like I, I remember reading a Scorsese interview where he was like, When I pick a song, it's about adding something that the scene isn't otherwise communicating. And then sure. this movie has a scene where Lois Lane is going to the memorial site for Superman, and the lyrics of the song are They said the gods would outlive us, but they <laughs> We're wrong. <laughs> well, I guess like, are you, do you think that, cause he's a, you know, comes from a music video background that he is going, I want this Nick Cave song and then writes to the Nick Cave song or does he, or, or does he do like, cause he's not writing. He's a needle he drop do, guy. He's he a needle drop, drop guy. Needle, like, and yeah. he's also, yeah. he's a corny motherfucker. I mean, this is one right. of the reasons why it's like, you know, you, you really got to reckon with his work. It's either like very much your thing, very much not your thing, or you got to do what the four of us did, which is really try to work with it. I am a 50, 50 Zack Snyder same. guy. Like sometimes it works. Right. Sometimes it doesn't. And then oh, when it do I'm like, I'm out. I'm like, I'm hard pressed to find a Zack Snyder movie that works I like, for me. I like, Army, I uh, like the the zombie movie. I mm. like a lot of Man of Steel. I do too. Uh, you I'm know, you especially the first yeah. uh, the first half of it is really very good. And then yeah, I like the I like half. this. Yeah, um, and I like three hundred. Like those are yeah. those. If, I, if those I, are I like, like my three hundred. I don't like 300. Nah, like I, none, I saw it once. So none I, of I'm those also, work I'm not, me, I'm yeah. not going back to 300. I wonder if I went back and saw it now, what I would feel. I think it's this, the Avatar effect, which was like the first time I saw Avatar. I was like, whoa. Well, this is uh, cool in 3D. Good. Yeah, Avatar uh, rips. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm going to be the lone dissenting yeah. opinion that is like, I'm pretty sure Avatar, like, I couldn't <laughs> tell, like, there, there isn't a movie who's has a starker difference between box office or, 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 mm. or, or cumulative money made mm. and, and like invisible cultural footprint. David and I talk about it. Oh, all this is the this time. is a this David is a movie that doesn't exist. Constantly. Right. I this bought is it, right? his newborn Isn't that what you guys say? baby, a baby Navi onesie, so he, he can did. dress up his daughter 
Like a baby Navi complete that, with tail. But does it? Did, do did you have to buy a real one or did you have to make I one of your own? I bought it from one. the Disney store. <laughs> the Disney store. Like, by the way, I've been to Navi at yeah. uh, Animal Kingdom. It, it, it's the it, best. There is more mer- oh, oh, the puppets they Wait, have on the Wait, to Pandora? Show. You've oh, been sorry, to Pandora? Sorry, sorry, yes, I've the world been to Pandora. Pandora. Yes, World, world of Pandora. Right. Uh, and, and it was, by the way, one of the best amusement park rides I've ever been on in my life compared to one of the worst. Yeah. D- speaking of also like the corniness of him, I will say that the character I probably have the biggest issue with is Flash. I, like mm. Flash to me feels to like a character that is like, I feel like it's a non-funny person being like, this is my funny character. And at certain points it's a little bit too much, but at the same time, at the end of the movie, I kind of felt like I, 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 I I have a I have a, I th- a hard relationship. I with think him. it's hard inside of this movie, which is to be very clear, humorless, right. yeah. dour, sullen, grief ridden. Uh, every character is dealing with essential traumas that have happened to them. Every single cut, when they cut, they cut to another character who has experienced loss. Or is it, or is in the midst of a personal catastrophe? Every single one of them, right? right. And so when you, Ezra Miller really is the the Flash is the only per, his dad's in jail, which is bad. We that's like the, that is a trauma uh, for killing his mom. Um, but he at the very least they try and structure him like he's a kid. He, you know, in the Snyder Cut, there's a girl, there's like, and he, he, he has barely used his powers. He's trying to he get really a job. is right. I mean, they're simultaneously, yeah. they're putting so much on this character because, like, the Flash is the only, like, you know, a list DC hero who is funny. I would argue, right, right. Whereas a lot of the Marvel characters are funny. And um, DC, I'm sorry, Hawkman is hilarious. Well, but that's like that's like if you get him at a bar at three o'clock in the morning, he's funny. He doesn't say that shit publicly, you know. Um, Behind but, closed doors, Hawkman is the funny guy. Right, but they're like DC characters, like Booster Gold and like yeah, Plastic yeah, Man, right, who are funny, right, but, but they're the outskirts. Gods right, are not, the gods right, are yeah. very solemn and self serious. Flash has always been the one character that's kind of funny. Ezra is the only actor in this film with any sort of comedic background, right? Yeah. So it's like, I feel like they're simultaneously putting the weight on this one character to both be their Spider-Man and their Tony Stark, right? Yeah, I think you're right. It's just overstuffed. And like sometimes the character strains from them putting all of that. Like you need to be the fun, and, emotionally relatable And I think that we didn't try to do that for Momoa. I think we didn't yes. try to like create this other version of Aquaman that was like less of a loner and more Party of like. Dude. Yeah. And that yep. and that was not uh that was not successful. Well, and 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 Whedon's Flash is like an a coward at like he's like yeah. too scared. He right? needs to be like you know? coached through the set pieces, from it, what I remember. Yeah, right? yeah, in the set piece, he's like, I, I can't do this. Right. And they're like, and Batman has to be like, save one person. Right. And he's like, what do you mean, just save one person? You know, and it's like, <laughs> right, he, well, no. God, that movie. You so know, like uh, stupid. It's Sorry. so dumb, but it's no, no, no. But it's really true. It's so dumb because it and it really takes agency away from mm-hmm. uh, the Barry Allen character because you know it, it, we've seen him participate. We've seen well, he's like, capable. Right, the introduction he in might this just movie be green. Is him saving one person, and then in the yeah. Whedon cut, it's an hour into the movie, him saying, "I don't know how to save a single person." Yeah, yeah, and and I think that there's something about like it's it's tricky. The Whedon cut has like two sequences where they're describing what they're going to do when they get to Russia. And this movie, obviously way longer, but I understood what they were doing in a much cleaner sense in this film than I did in the uh, in the Whedon version of it, where it was like also like, I don't know. I mean, I just uh, just to say well, it's like, like the, the Whedon versions building popsicle stick bridges in order to cut out 40 minutes in between two points. Like, can you right. Joss, can you write one scene that uh, enables us to skip over all of this. Oh, yeah. And the Snyder cut takes that 40 minutes that Whedon cut out and makes it 90 doubles minutes. It. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, Long- he doubles it. He doubles it and he shows you how everybody gets to every location like literally. Right. And if you every uh, if if you hate Snyder, which like I I'm I'm with Jason where I was like predominantly out 
on Snyder. And now I feel like after this and rewatching everything, I begrudgingly come to like a 50 50 state with him where it's like, I got to just respect the thing he does, even if it's not my thing to a certain Mm -hmm. degree. But I do feel like if you don't like him, it is probably it feels incredibly oppressive to watch four hours of this. I wonder if these weren't characters that I do know. I wonder if these were just movies. That's another thing I would. If I would find more enjoyment out of them, if these were just stories of gods and uh, or whatever, like right. you know, like clearly, original, let me be right. yeah. yeah yeah. Let me be clear, like 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 Zack Snyder is an incredibly uh, compelling visual stylist. You know, like he's not a bad filmmaker. I don't I don't like his worldview or his point of view, and so the movies don't tend to to resonate with me. But I still like them. It's like. He's straight out of the Christopher Nolan school of in- impeccable filmmaking, but inside of it, like Tenet for me felt hollow, mm. you know, mm. uh, but mm. but so gorgeous to watch. Mm. I loved I loved watching Tenet, but I was like, what what story did it I Sounds just like you watch? could use a temporal pincer movement. Uh, <laughs> the temporal pincer movement? Oh, yeah. brother. Spe- uh, that's speaking of another speedster. Uh, um, <laughs> look. Here's the thing I've been thinking about with with Snyder, with his three DC movies, because I like a lot of Man of Steel. I love the Krypton stuff. Yeah. I struggle with certain things in it. I still don't really understand why he couldn't rescue Kevin Costner from a tornado. Like there's certain things in that movie where I'm like, I, I get that you're building to a moment here, but I just I, I can't I can't handle the logic Confounding of your story writing. decisions yeah. in that movie. Right. Yeah. And Batman versus Superman, <laughs> which the the ultimate cut or whatever it's called does improve, I agree, Griffin, but still that movie is about people making really stupid decisions constantly. Like because they Batman has to fight Superman. So you're kind of watching both Batman and Superman be dumb. And you're like, right. Will you guys just have a conversation for crying out loud? Like right. you can figure this out in two minutes. And Instead, you have to do all this bullshit and then Martha. Like, you know, it's like that that movie only works if you uh, view it through the prism of I'm supposed to hate both of these characters. Right. And then (laughs) in Justice League, no one is stupid. That is my point. Right. There is no longer anyone burdened by ridiculous plot contrivance. It's like, look, guys, we got to come together. There's a Steppenwolf. You know, like it's a much simpler thing. I feel like he got the note after Batman v Superman. It evolved. Yes. Like in a in a way, like and I don't know, like obviously you said that it was like shooting very quickly afterwards, but mm. on set even I feel like they made some choices that that when he shot it that helped make things make sense. I will say it was confused when um like I get Superman fighting Wonder Woman and Aquaman and and even the flash sequence is awesome. Like that sequence it's between cool. Superman and the Flash, so cool. But when he fires his his uh his uh you know his laser eyes on uh on Batman there um well, like bat, what what has he got there that's going to protect his arms from the gauntlet. Gauntlet. He's got gauntlet. power gauntlet. Oh, gauntlet. Gauntlet. He's got gauntlet. power absorbing gauntlets. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, gauntlet. Gauntlet. Oh, sorry. sorry. Jeremy Irons oh, Jeremy Irons made right. them for him. So I, I guess I missed that detail and now when you said gauntlets now I'm pulling it all together. There you might have been sleeping. <laughs> the one thing Whedon added that I think was logical is that Whedon adds that it is an active decision to bring Lois into that scenario to calm mm-hmm. Superman down whereas in right. the Snyder cut she just kind of is hanging out and then when he sees she's her, in the like, neighborhood oh, hey. <laughs> right which just, uh, just that feels like classic you know script, script polishing thing where Whedon's like well, why why this should be an active rather than a passive right. decision that feel that's the only change i noticed i just wanted to shout it out that the, the, it, it's different between the two cuts the where i'm like i think the well, no, no, it cut makes sense. i wanted that to read yeah. i wanted to read this quote uh that i thought was interesting um so joss whedon just talked about why he added in the family because we could argue that the, the family in russia is one of the biggest uh it's so things fucking- that he, joss whedon adds in and uh so he, joss whedon says uh, for him, the most important thing is for what is it like for the people on the ground? That's always going to be important to me. Like there's Hawkeye helping people off the bus. You have to have someone who works on ground level who's taking care of the smaller stuff. Um, and he's talking about this as far as like what he added into Age of Ultron, which is very similar, which is like they they have a lot of uh, of helping people. And the uh, Sokovians, right. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, uh, you know, he, he said like, Basically, he he brought that Sarkovian attitude into Justice League because he felt like he's like he's like I he's like I shot 
three days just tracking civilians on the ground uh, because I wanted to see, I mean, you know, like real devastation. But I, I also like a, a movie this big. I don't care about it. Like, I don't care about it. Yeah, I don't it's know. a thing I agree with conceptually that does not work in execution at all. And perhaps if you were designing that to be part of the movie from the ground up, it would work. But in its form, it's just like this is so clearly shoehorned in. It when works you- in the boys when the boys is built around that idea on some level. Right. Like a, a normal person who's been affected or even that like one shot that Lindsay. Uh, uh, Lizzie Kaplan. Uh, the the that, Marvel yes. one shot. Yeah. 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 The, the Lizzie Kaplan did. It was like, oh, well, this is interesting. Like, this is like. But you almost need to almost that's an island. It's not like at the climax. I feel like that's the problem in my mind. Well, the the thing in Batman versus Superman that I like is that opening sequence where you're seeing Man of Steel from the ground. And yeah, it's this sort rules. of like apocalyptic 9-11, you know, thing. And that's where Ben Affleck, the Batman is getting so mad. And you're like, OK, OK, this is very powerful. But then most of that movie is Lex Luthor being like, I heard Superman doesn't like you. And Batman's like, what? I'll punch him. You know, like you're like, why is Lex right. Luthor getting over on you like this? <laughs> it's literally like it's like gossip. It's high school gossip. Uh, it's yeah. it's absurd, but but I agree with you. The extended cut of Batman versus Superman, just like the Snyder cut, proves that if you give Snyder a long enough, you know, give him a long enough runtime, the movie will just make more sense, right? Right, and it will trick you into thinking it was more satisfying. <laughs> yeah. I think, right? I yes. think yeah. it's a. I think the. I you think put this more is time like, in. I think so it's a like, magic. Well. I think it's a magic trick. Right. You give it more time, but it makes more sense. So when you look at it, you're like, well, I. I understand it at least. Like when I watched the original cut of Batman versus Superman or the Whedon cut of Justice League, partially what what was what's so difficult about mo- those movies is there is an inherent tension based on what is missing, making the movies not really make sense. The movies are asking you to do too much work. Yeah. And as a result are unsatisfying. And these, because they're doing more work for you feel more satisfying and you mistake that I'm, you know, you can mistake that for them being better and they are just better constructed. But like I said before, they are better constructed, like brutalist architecture yes. that like if if I saw it in Russia, I would be like, wow, that's an impressively, right. uh, br- that's an impressively solid a concrete slab of a, <laughs> so of a building. Serious. Yeah. But it's like, but you-, but you know what I would love more windows. Right. I would like more windows <laughs> to let more light in. I don't want to live in that building, I mean, the, you know, the, and that's what it is. The buy-in on this on this thing is huge, right? And it essentially asks, like, you gotta just check your reservations at the door. You gotta be pot committed. Because you ask, like, Paul, why do 50% of people hate this? It's because yeah. if you're not really giving it a chance and you come in with your, like, my and, and general you don't distaste... Have to. To you be don't clear. have to. Right. You do not. Yeah, have no one to. has right. to. But it's like if if you're coming in looking at it askance, you will find 15 things a minute that just boggle the mind. Like in the sequence we talked about, where Cyborg starts to see that he can manipulate the financial markets, the the like pretentious self seriousness of Snyder combined with shit like he feels the need to visualize that by showing a CGI bull. Oh, my God. Uh, yes. oh, Wrestling a bear so, yes, so right. you understand. He also does the same. For, doesn't he also do the same? Does he do the same for, like, political parties yes. or something? There, where, there's yes. a lot of weird imagery yeah. in that background. Although I did like the way that you got into his mindscape. But then I would also say that there's a there's a way that he treats these characters. And, look, I am more of a, a Marvel person. I probably, in my DC world, when I was a kid, I read a little bit more Superman. I, then I really read a lot more Batman. And uh, so I can't speak to the character of Wonder Woman. I will say this, watching that opening sequence of her in the bank, that I thought was an awesome sequence, like a very Mm -hmm. cool, better than anything in Wonder Woman 84, like that mall sequence and what, like if that was whatever, I I liked that sequence. I did find it confusing that she immediately, that she does murder them. She does murder all those people and then goes up to that kid and goes, well, you can be whatever you want. It is a, it is like, oh, my understanding of Wonder Woman is not that she is, this kind of a murderer. But again, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Like, but in I think in Zack Snyder's universe, 
they all kill right yes. like be, like yes. they all kill in this world right. like that that's that's part of the language of i mean like like the 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 you know um and that is what again if you're playing by the if you're playing by the rules inside of Zack Snyder's universe then i agree with david what you were saying earlier the opening of the extended cut of batman v superman which is this like the movie opens with like 10 minutes of what is what might as well be raw footage of September 11th. Right. You know what I mean? Right. It is it's, it's it is Affleck so driving around uh, Metropolis yes. is being ruined. Driving around Superman Metropolis in a Jeep yeah. in a very product placement Jeep oh. while to, while tens of thousands of people are dying inside of the buildings that are being destroyed right. by the Kryptonian fight between Michael Shannon and um, Superman. Yeah. Um, right? Michael Shannon? Yeah, is yeah. That yeah Michael yeah. Shannon played yeah. himself so, in those movies. No, he, uh, he yeah. played himself. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, he didn't play. Yeah, that was the secret. Everybody <laughs> right. thought he was going to be Zod and he was just Michael <laughs> Shannon. Michael well, Shannon. Uh, yeah, even more intimidating, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Terrifying. But, but, yeah, his superpower <laughs> comes from the stage. That's the thing, though. It's like, as much as he has this sort of like complicated big picture vision of the thing that cannot be reduced to a tidy two-hour package. Snyder, for me, is fundamentally a filmmaker who thinks about what is the coolest thing I could do at this moment. Yeah. Whether it's a story decision, a visual decision, a tonal thing, whatever it is. And he doesn't really care about those things butting up against each other in a way that sort of works against itself, you know? And I mean, in, in, yeah. in a weird way, he's saying, I think, you know, as Marvel is exploring the multiverse, we we are I think we're we're on the precipice of that opening up in a much larger way, and I think Flash uh, Flashpoint the the Flash movie that they're making mm -hmm. with where Michael Keaton is coming back as Batman, it looks like DC is opening up the multiverse, and the way that they're going to be I think tying their all their worlds together is by saying. Anything can happen. There's multiple worlds and all this sort of stuff. I think that Zack Snyder kind of is reinviting himself into the party and going, this is where I'm going to, my multiverse is this. I'm going to exist in this world where I can live by my own rules and it can look cool. And and that's, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a very interesting I, I think you're right. I think it's like his ideas. Like They could have a version. There, there, there could be a situation in the future where Zack Snyder makes the nightmare yes. movie. Um, and it's not, it's just, it, we're out like at a certain point, if flashpoint kind of gives us the multiverse, then we are, we have the opportunity to not have there be a status quo. Yes. It, like every, right. the Snyder's thing can be in just Snyder's thing. It can be, everything can be siloed in its different universe and it, and they can mix if they want, I guess. I, I don't know. I'm curious how they're going to how they're going to approach this. It could be very interesting. Well, now he's already talking about a sequel. This is the Monday after it's been released that we're recording this. And he's already saying, well, now, yeah, I guess people want me to make a sequel. And so that might be something that we see. The thing, I never would have predicted that this thing would exist. If you, when, when right. the yes. first, you know, Snyder Cut talk started, I was very much like, there's no such thing as a Snyder Cut. Sure, he may have had an assembly cut of a movie, but like, that's not the same thing. And I never would have predicted that Warner Brothers would pony up 70 million bucks to let this thing drop on streaming, essentially. I would never imagine they would have to pony up an additional $300 million. God knows how much fucking money you would have to pay to get Affleck back, Cavill back, you know, like, yeah. you know, but never say never, I guess at this point has to be the, you know, even though like Ray Fisher is calling for like CEOs of Warner Brothers to step down yes. and like Tanasi Coates is writing a black Superman movie for JJ Abrams, but like it still could occur. All right? these it, things can exist. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think, I guess, I guess like the way I feel about it is regardless of how you feel about Zack Snyder in this film, I think uh, I'm going to butcher this name, so please, y all of you are, are much smarter than me. Uh, it, it, what, what's that movie? It's a uh, uh, Kona Quatsi or uh, Koyana Koyana Skatsi. Yes, you can view this movie like you can view that movie, where it's like just <laughs> sit back, <laughs> right? Wait, listen, sto do you mean stoned? <laughs> I mean, do you mean stoned? Honestly, you should view it stoned. But in a way, yes, yes. In a way, like just like if you take your your functioning brain off and just want to look at like some purely beautiful visuals, see some things, 
like, I think this movie does work on a, on a base level, just like, I think it could be, I mean, I felt that at certain points it's kind of swept up in it. Too. Well, like, and to, to follow Jason's analogy, it's almost like you got to just kind of respect brutalist architecture, even if it is not your thing. So maybe just like yeah, walk by it, take a look at it, go, huh, that is wild that someone wants to make a building that way and that yeah. this much work was put into constructing a building that way. And then you think to yourself, glad I don't live there or work there on about my day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel yeah. like this is not. Um, these are not movies that I will ever return to no. the way that I return to there are Marvel movie like I have rewatched you know Thor Ragnarok I've rewatched the Spider-Man uh, the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies mm-hmm. I've rewatched there are so many superhero properties never mind um, you know into the Spider-Verse and some of the animated stuff but you know like these are movies those are movies I go back to over and over again because they they vibrate at the frequency of superhero storytelling that I'm interested in watching yeah. in a way that these um, Snyder movies do not. Does that make them bad? No, it just makes them not for me. You right. know what I mean? And that's fine. I, I, you know, they make more sense now that they have seen these longer cuts. They, 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 the storylines line up in a way that, if he did make another one that was this nightfall, you know, kind of dystopian future or a nightmare or whatever, mm-hmm. this dystopian future, I, I'm curious. I'm also curious for a movie in which the new gods come to Earth. There's like, like I'm, I, I like Kirby. Like I want Dark Side. Like I'm curious. You know, like there's something there. I just, I just am always like, man, Zack Snyder stuff just doesn't if, hit if me you don't, right. If you for don't it. like. If you don't like Italian, we're not saying don't put an Italian restaurant in my neighborhood. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you about to say something like offensive against Italian? <laughs> Who are you? No, I'm just saying, Mike I'm just the saying, Spoon Man Mitchell? Uh, Two hours What in. is this, the Doughboys? Uh, <laughs> is this a Doughboys episode? Can't we night nice slice in here? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is we, like... But are, we, are you Mr. Snice? Uh, Mr. Slice, rather? I'm combining all like, of his I nicknames. just think that there is a thing where, unfortunately... The Night Spoon and Mr. Slice. <laughs> night Slice. Night Slice. Night Slice. Which is my new Chris Terrio scripted, uh, Zack Snyder produced <laughs> HBO Max movie. Um, oh my God. But I guess what I'm saying is this. It's like the my whole opinion on this is I think unfortunately Marvel has set a – I love Marvel. I love what they're doing. I'm on board. But I think they have set a an unrealistic expectation for what superhero movies are, what people expect from them. I think you can see that in the Sony films. Not to say the Sony films are perfect uh, that they have done. But – it allows very little uh, – It, I think that people view them as anything different as being bad, where I think what we need to do is go – we need to expand this this thing, but but it's but Marvel has created the template, and I think when you break the template, it's very hard. And I, you know, to I think what that- Marvel has done beautifully is made movies that feel like comics, right? Right, like they, the Marvel movies feel the most they, like right. comic books, like like going in to the, the store that, every week, right. keeping up with a naughty. Yeah. Like expansive right. universe where characters cross over and meet each other and do blah blah blah. That is what they have replicated. But that, that for the movies, movies, yes. But that the movies and uh, and characters are differentiated from each other in tone, in style, yeah. and in performance. Like there is, they're not all doing the same thing. Right. Just the way that if you pick up a Thor book. If you pick up Jason Aaron's Thor, you know, uh, and you read the... And, the, and you should. Which yeah. everybody uh, should read Jason Aaron's Thor drawn by Isad Ribic. I never liked like Thor you're before gonna... Jason Aaron took over Thor. Uh, oh, my God. You read that book and you're like, I'm reading something incredible. The sa- then if you pick up Nick Spencer's Spider-Man, totally, totally different, subject matter totally different, and nonetheless incredibly compelling. But, but Marvel gets that. Key difference, Go ahead, Griff. Key difference. Marvel has never let anyone make anything as individualistic as one of the nope. Snyder movies. Right. That's the thing. It's like, we'll make these different from each other, but we're never going to let someone go that well, far at the end of the day, it sure. is, it is, and what I think works really good for Marvel is Kevin Feige is the gatekeeper of all things Marvel. He's and, the showrunner. Yeah, and, but, yeah. and we've seen when it, when it hasn't worked, which is Jeff Loeb and everything that has come out of the Netflix uh, Marvel Sabotron. world. And, and, and it's like, those were 
I think, disappointing to Marvel fans. And I think it was disappointing to some of those characters. And it's like, yeah, well... Let the person. Wait, have you talked to some of those characters? Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, have you I mean, heard from I think those you characters? Know Iron Fist. <laughs> I talked to Iron Fist. He was very. Was upset. Danny Rand like Paul? I I would love to talk to. You. Uh, the like were... I should have stayed at Kun. <laughs> I should have stayed in Kudlin. <laughs> but I mean, you know what it is? I just think it's like you look forward to those characters and you waited for the Marvel. Like I think, especially with Daredevil, and I think people really. But I love Jessica Jones. But it's like it was a very hit or miss thing, and I think Marvel has said, I think more successfully than any franchise ever, we got this. Like, we right. will give you, at worst, a B. You Like, you know, like a movie can come in and it's like, eh, it was a, fine. Like, and then, or, you know, maybe a B minus. Like, you know, it's like, uh, but I think they're getting less. Well, Thor, Thor the Dark World is like it's a, a straight D yeah. minus. I, I, I mean, we're, that, we're, we're, true, we're on the other side of that one, Jason. Hey, look, this it, I will never it's understand. It's its own episode. This, you know, well, we can have it some side. We can have the but, we'll, we'll come on blank check. I would yeah. love on, to talk about on. that. But I would like to rewatch it. But I think, but I guess what I'm saying is, and that is cool, but nothing that everything doesn't have to be that. Like totally. James Bond right. isn't that. Yeah. Like James Bond gives it over to different people to take over and dra- it's I just think there's there's room for all of this. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I have totally given up any sort of preciousness about IP at this point because that's what it is. It's fucking IP. They're gonna keep on milking this stuff mm-hmm. over and over again. It'll and not never only end. will they reboot yeah. it every five years, but they'll do four versions of the same thing at the same time. And to Jason's point, like I love the fucking fourth world stuff. I would love to see a gonzo, banana pants, bright, colorful, goofy fourth world movie. Ava DuVernay is supposed to make this movie and is writing it with Tom King. My fear watching, you know, this, uh, the the Whedon Frankenstein version in 2017 was, man, is that fourth world movie going to have to fit into this version of Steppenwolf and right. even the parademons and this kind of grayscale shit? But now I'm just like, if he gets to do his fourth world stuff and someone else gets to make a fourth world movie that's silly, you know, I don't care. Like, let everyone do their own thing. And, and, you know, look, and there will always be opinions, which is why <laughs> we're going to quickly get into some second opinions. The movie was a piece of shit, yet this person recommends it. Tell me what is the message, maybe that art is subjective. Second opinion. All right, so these are second opinions that are from the Joss Whedon cut. These are five star reviews of Joss Whedon uh, Justice League, which I wanted to bring up because there there are some good ones. These are all cold uh, from the Amazon.com. Uh, Nate Kylie pulled them, and uh, and here here we go. Um, okay, this one's written by Fan Out West. Do not hesitate to buy this movie and enjoy it. Unlike the Zack Snyder films, the cast actually looks like they're having fun making it. In my opinion, the cast of Marvel movies look like they're worn out and tired. The mustache that was removed via CGI is very short and not noticeable if you're not looking for it. (laughs) Jason Momoa is off the hook as Aquaman and Ben Affleck's Batman is great. Yes, I said it. Ben Affleck is a great Batman. Don't listen to dirty, rotten tomatoes. They haven't been right about a movie in years. And if you don't want to have fun watching a movie, then throw the Arrival or Grand Budapest Hotel in the big old Blu-ray player and bore yourself silly. Wow. The big old Blu-ray player? Do we have like a right. jumbo one for the Grand Blu-ray <laughs> Dirty Hotel? Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> yes. There's so much stuff. That's here. the Dirty Rotten Scoundrels sequel uh, yeah. we need. Uh, we should work on that. Uh, Arrival and Grand Budapest, notably uh, well-received films that also were commercially successful, uh, both I entertaining in very different ways. Like they're not yeah, like not one similar. film is serious, one film is a very goofy, <laughs> like madcap caper. Yeah, well, that this is a five-star review, and it ends with this line here. It says. Warner Brothers, hire some Disney PR people and give us JL2 and bribe yourselves some critics. If the Uh, Mouse House can do it, so (laughs) can you. Five stars. Then we go into this one. This is written by Mark. Great story. Extremely well executed by cast and crew. I hate Lex Luthor. Is that wrong of me? I think not. Zack Snyder has always been great at putting it all together, but I also love Zack Snyder's Sucker Punch. Why doesn't someone 
kick Lex Luthor's butt. I don't mean a superhero. I mean a regular dude. You know, catch him in the bathroom. Have him slip on a bar of soap a couple of times. Five stars. <laughs> uh, just wants to be. Just took that time to wow. say he wanted to beat up a uh, uh, beat up Lex Luthor. And then, then I'll finally end on this one. This is by Thomas Lernahan. Should have been shelved by the WB and DC when Snyder could not finish the picture rather than allowing another person to take the reins who had no business in the DC universe. While I do not like what Snyder was going to do with some of the characters, overall, this movie was pretty good. Five stars. (laughs) (laughs) Twist? A real twist there at the end. Uh, So those are some five stars. There has not been enough reviews here about this one. Uh, But any... Uh, Final thoughts, guys. I mean, we really uh, talked a lot. I think a lot about, I mean, a lot about, I mean, we didn't break it down in the things because I think you're right. This is a movie that can be literally torn apart on every level if you're not buying in on it. And if you are, I think it's a pleasant surprise, or at least that's why I feel. And, And who knows if it's perspective or... or the history, or I don't know. I thought, you know, just a couple things. Like, I thought Amy Adams just... You know, has so little to do Third in this movie. Third, Third build. Third build. Wow. I mean, Cavill's second build for crying out loud. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. So I brutally. Think that that's probably yeah. like how you, they order in which yeah, they got into the seniority. franchise. Right, yeah. Right, right, right. But, um, but I thought she's great. She's so, so watchable she's and good. she's so great. She's good. You know, people are giving performances that are very good in circumstances that are, oh. I would assume as an actor, very And bad. by the way, I want to just call out one of my favorite moments in the movie. I just looked at my notes. Force majeure, the pregnancy test. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, a great uh, prop design there, <laughs> force majeure. Uh, Incredible. Uh, really, really. Uh, I hope, so she's uh, pregnant. Yeah, she's pregnant. They're going to have a baby. I hope that force majeure pregnancy tests become like Zack Snyder's red apple cigarettes, that they oh, remain right. a product in every that. movie from here on out. <laughs> that yeah. would be incredible. <laughs> Um, I, I, it is hard for me to imagine that we live in a world, a society, say it, we live in a society, uh, that we live in a society in which Diane Lane is Ma Kent and Marissa Tomei is Aunt May. Like th- this is like, I don't even understand how we've gotten to a point where the older moms are the hottest women on earth. And I'm here for it's it. It's also right? funny like, that like Diane Lane is almost going full opening of Edward Scissorhands. Like they put yes. so much gray on her. She's like <laughs> yeah. doing an old lady voice. They're like, Diane, you got to be less hot. Anything you can. <laughs> you have to be less, you can't do less it. vivacious. You can't make Diane Lane not hot, by the way. You they can. failed. You can't. You, you it's, can. uh, you can. She is so, uh, did so great- compelling. I think they did a great job of like her and Kevin Costner were a very yes. like they were not like what you would like. They were great. They were great. Smart they just like they, yeah. they just look like. Yeah. Like these are a, like they weren't just like, well, you know, they they had a they had a life to them. I, I like Kevin Costner in that film as well. I mean, even I, though his picture only makes great. an appearance. Yeah, yeah I do right. too. Yeah. Now, on, on the flip side of that. J.K. Simmons is announced as Commissioner Gordon. Everyone goes, oh, oh, oh yes. that's cool casting. He shows up in Whedon for one scene. You're like, Jesus, How? why did they shank J.K. Yeah. Simmons this hard? All this J.K. Simmons stuff must have been left on the cut room floor. You watch this movie, the exact same amount of footage. <laughs> Right. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I think Ray, Ray Fisher said that's the only footage that he that was Snyder shot that's in the Two other scenes. cut. Yeah. I, right. I feel that, like he, and by the way, cyber. Snyder... Yes, yeah, you've got to figure that he was just going to be in the Batman movie substantially. Yes. Right. You know? I think what they were doing was what you all have been saying, which is he was trying to build 10 years very quickly. So it's mm-hmm. like, let me just drop these things. Like I'm, I'm seeding the world. I'm seeding the world. And and so, yes, I'll cast a big name person to come in for one scene, knowing that it will pay. Like he's, I think, doing it the right way. So it's not a bunch of recasting. And it was like, you know, Kersey Clemens clearly is going to, I mean, now she's not, but was going to be a part of the world. No, she is again now. Oh, she is. Oh, she She is. is. Okay, okay, okay. She is again now. It was like, it's gone four different ways, but as of this moment, she's back in the movie as the female. Okay. So that's, okay, it's so interesting. Interesting. God knows. It's all weird. It's all super weird. All of it is as weird all of this is as weird as the fake upper lip on the weed nah. Superman. Absolutely. Uh, I will say one thing too. Uh, one time when I was directing something, I was doing a table, I was doing a scene around a table and I was trying to figure out 
oh, how can I shoot this in an interesting way where the camera's moving because there's a lot of exposition and dialogue. And I was like, I'm going to, sp- uh, I will have the camera spin around the table. And I did like two takes of it. And I was like, this is nausea inducing. Like, I can't, this is not going to be good. It will not cut. It's, it's going to look like shit. Just, uh, Zack Snyder really embraces that spin around the table to mm-hmm. a point where I'm, I was dying laughing at how much we were going. Like, it was like a merry-go-round. We were around that table a lot like it was like that's it he's committed to that directorial choice and in a movie that is so slick that did stick out to me as being a little bit bizarre he makes weird choices the dude, <laughs> so there's, weird. A, there's a goofiness yes he's got weird taste and at the end of the day when we're talking about like well you have to buy into this movie either you're gonna love it or you're gonna hate it it's like i think all four of us are appreciating this from the exact same perspective which is what a weird thing that this exists. What a bizarre history mm-hmm. to get to this point. Having it at this state in such an expanded object is such a curio. You kind of have to view it on a very different through a very yeah. different prism than any other movie you've ever watched. And you're sort of holistically taking in all the baggage along with actually considering yeah. what's on screen. Well, not for nothing, the fact that all of us rewatched stuff. Um, yeah. Simply to simply to give context to it is significant. I, you know, like never this intended is to a, rewatch any of those movies. No, guys, I was this excited is to like, watch Josh uh, Whedon last night. I was like, all right, here we go. Let's get into it. <laughs> this is like we are all like these are the stories that we're all like p- pulling apart and trying to find meaning in some combination of all of these characters and all of these scenes. You know, there is there is something about this that is very it's very interesting and compelling to talk about but again i'm hard pressed to think if i would ever watch any of these movies ever again and 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 i suspect the answer is no unless called upon in something like this to do it like like these bring me no joy but i'm deeply curious yeah you know i'm i'm like so compelled by the story surrounding the making of this story i guess I agree, <sighs> but I also can could use I could use a break. I will say from the whole Snyder I cut agree. and the whole superhero movie discourse. I could use a, a half an hour. Just we did let's, it. We let's, got, let's, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We you let know it, what I mean, guys? Okay, what's it? guys? I have breaking news. Okay. I want to break into the pod. I have breaking news. Vin Diesel's son huh. has been cast in Fast and Furious Nine yes. to play. Little dog. It was down to Let's me and him. It it, they went in a different direction. <laughs> wow. But it was great. It was down Griff, to me. Wow. How did you not get this part? I worked oh, really hard. Ultimately. Is that why your head is shaved yeah, right now? Yeah. Ultimately, <laughs> I think he had a little bit of an in mm, mm. that I did. You know what? But that, that is, oh, this makes me so angry. I mean, and now I, I, you know, I don't know if you guys know this. I am part of the Fast and Furious family now, uh, the animated. Uh, world of Fast and Furious. You motherfucker. Uh, what? I yes, wish I, I, was on that show. I am. Uh, I am one You're of the characters. I am in. Uh, I have a very small part, and I believe two episodes of Spy uh, Racers. Fa- spy yeah, Racers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Spy Racers. And uh, oh wow! So I'll talk about it more when I when uh, when I can. You know, I don't want to. Again, I don't, look. We're in a moment of mourning for Griff here. I don't want to yeah. rub anything anyway. I, I should also uh, mention yeah, yeah. one more piece of uh, breaking news. Uh, Anne Cernoff. Uh, who is in charge of Warner Brothers, uh, did an interview that just came out today. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're sort of asking her a bunch of questions about, like, where does this go now, this and that. And she was throwing out dodgy answers. And then she finally says, I appreciate that they love Zach's work, and we are very thankful for his many contributions to DC. We're just so happy that he could bring his cut of the Justice League to life because that wasn't in the plan until about a year ago. With that comes the completion of his trilogy. We're very happy wow. we've done this, but we're very excited about the plans we have for all the multidimensional DC characters that are being developed Boom. right now. And, yes. and, and, okay. Griff, as, and Griff, as you were talking, I also want to read one more quote from that article. She also unequivocally says, there will be this no David Ayer cut of Suicide he's, Squad. He's trying to leap on the bandwagon. He's trying to be like, yeah, look, right. they edited my movie to death. Where's my release the air cut? And some people are like, oh, release the air cut. And I think she's trying to be like, no, no, this is not a precedent setter. Right. This it's is an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> we're not going to be releasing cuts willy nilly on HBO <laughs> yeah. Max. Okay. <laughs> I would like them to start. Re- I would like them to release my cut of Dirty Grandpa. <laughs> I would like to see that. I would like to see right. it. Um, 
Guys, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Obviously, uh, you know, we want people to listen to Blank Check, uh, which is a great podcast. Uh, but individually, anything we uh, want to plug? Uh, uh, Blank Check, yeah. this week we're doing our, our year-end awards episode, and then Blank we're starting awards. a, a little miniseries on uh, the films of Elaine May. That's right. I'm April, April is May. excited about that. April is May. Paul and I are both listening to the Mike Nichols audio book right now. It was one of the best books I read. We actually had Mark Harris on Unspooled uh, to talk about Mike Nichols, and it was uh, it was great. Uh, he uh, that book is fantastic, and now. I want to I want to dive into Elaine May as much as I have been diving into Mike Nichols. So. Rad movies. Was, um, I'm very excited. That was very fun miniseries. I'm, yeah. Uh, the George Lucas talk show with uh, Jason and Paul and David have all been on multiple times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, a very uh, odd, hard to describe show I do with the great comedian Connor Ratliff, where he plays George Lucas and I play a uh, Watto, the Tordarian it, junk shop owner, and we interview real people and, in character. And it has its and own it on mythology. Twitch. It's on Twitch. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's on Twitch, right. uh, what, yeah, Sunday nights? Uh, uh, Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, planetscum.live. Okay, planetscum.live. Jason, anything you got to talk about? In a week, I will be uh, in uh, a new Amazon animated series as we're talking about superhero stories. Uh, Robert Kirkman's Invincible is coming out. Oh, I'm um, so excited for that. It's great. It is a one-hour superhero uh, brutal incredibly cool, incredibly fun, funny, um, uh, faithful adaptation. Kirkman himself scripting uh, an incredible cast. Uh, if you've read Invincible, it's, you know, J.K. Simmons, Stephen Yeun, um, uh, Sandra O. Oh, uh, it's like a Gillian Jacobs, uh, Zussie Beats. It's like an incredible list of people. And I play Rexplode, guys. Cool. It's very fun. That is, the uh, best. That is very incredibly excited. exciting. That uh, and I will just quickly mention that I am in two things that you can check out. One is on Netflix. It's called uh, The Last Blockbuster. It's a documentary about uh, Blockbuster Video. And uh, and I am blown away by the amount of people who have seen it. And if you are a fan of this show, I do talk about my Jamie Gertz experience. And uh, she reached out to me, the girl that I thought, well, the girl who I play the fake Jamie Gertz in my autograph signing, which you can hear about in the oh, documentary. Funny. So she reached out to me. Uh, and, uh, and this movie that I did called Happily, a documentary by uh, Ben David Grabinski, is mm. out on VOD right now. It's super fun. Joel McHale, Carrie Bechet, uh, Kirby Howell Baptiste, uh, Shannon Woodward, uh, Charlene Yee, John Daly, so many people, uh, Stephen Root. It's uh, Twilight Zone meets Couples Retreat Weekend, and I think uh, you will like it. So there's what I got. Uh, a big thank you to uh, our amazing producer, Cody Fisher, our uh, sound engineer, uh, Devin Bryant, uh, of course, our movie picker who we sidelined this week. I, I told Avril, I was like, we're just going to go and jump into this. She's like, you haven't even seen it? I was like, I know, but we're going to do it. But Avril, a uh, great uh, movie picker, producer, uh, the best. Uh, also, Nick Kylie for his research and being able to break down the entire trajectory of this film. Uh, a big shout out to the ghost of Craig T. Nelson and Kyle Waldron for doing all of our art. A giant shout out to Molly Reynolds who is uh, my right hand and also a big part of how did this get made and getting this show uh, made all the time. And uh, if you want to talk about this movie, you want to rebut anything that we say, you can do it. You can give me a call at 619-P-A-U-L-A-S-K. That's 619-PAUL-ASK. We'll talk about it there. And you can join our Discord at discord.gg slash H-D-T-G-M. It's all there for you to talk about in our mini episode next week. We'll see you later. Bye for now. How did this get made?